Hey, guess what, everybody? Go listen to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. Joining us today on the Break It Down Show, many people joined us today, man. Thank you for joining us today <laughs> uh, on this cavalcade of stars. Because now we won't have to record a show for about the next month and a half. Anyway, joining us today is Phil Decker. Hello. Yeah. Hey, hey Phil. Phil. I'm still trying to figure out why I'm here. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> you got I'm stories joking, to tell. I'm Come on. I have all kinds of stories. Not as interesting as the one we just heard. I actually well, say you are a hard act to follow. Yeah, no kidding. <clears throat> Jessica Cameron is a no, hard no, no, act to follow. Um, first of all, do you know Corey? Corey, I, Phil, Phil, Corey. Hey, Corey. How you doing? Nice. So, so we've had a ton of musicians who come from Vallejo on our show. Oh, my. And uh, yes. you are the latest. I'm but, the You're a musician. Are you from Vallejo? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. I'm from Vallejo. What did you want to go to? I'm from Palo Alto. You're from Palo Alto. Oh, all right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Me too. So hey, let me tell the story. Oh, 87. Let me, let me tell the story yeah, yeah, yeah. because <laughs> this will all come uh, into focus for Corey. Uh, Phil Decker was, uh, went to Hogan High School, which is where Corey and I met. Mm. And I one day was thoroughly inspired, taken over. My entire imagination and being were taken over <laughs> by a young man named Alex Van Halen. And I thought, now I have found my calling. I have to seek out how I can fulfill this dream of mine. And so I was sitting in class one day, probably staring out the window in nothingness next to a guy named Richard Harris. And I said, <laughs> man, I, you know I want to play the drums. Fuck all this. And Rich said, you know who you need who you need to do is you need to go find Corey Jacobs. Do you know Corey Jacobs? And I said, no, I don't know Corey Jacobs. And he goes, you know, the real goofy dude walks down the street and jumps into the back. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's Corey Jacobs. And he goes, yeah, go meet Corey. Corey's the baddest dude I know. And I said, okay. Yeah, yeah. You, must, you must not know many people. But, oh! <laughs> so I did exactly that. I stopped everything that I was doing, and I introduced myself to Corey, and I started playing the drums. Also, concurrent to introducing myself to Corey, I knew there was another thing I had to do because it, I lived around the corner from Michael Colon. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I had to introduce myself to Michael Colon as well. And one of the things that Mike Colon did for me was he said, hey, have you ever heard of Truant? And I said, no, I never heard of Truant. And he said, no, come on. Did you see the TV20 dance party? This is good. And I said, of yeah. course I did. <laughs> he said, that was Truant. So the thing is... You left Hogan just before Corey and I showed up. Right. But what you left in your wake was a whole bunch of musicians who were able to see this TV show that you guys had been on. Phil was in a band in high school called Truant. And you guys were already rock stars as far as everybody was concerned. You guys had a you guys cut a 45. <clears throat> you guys cut a 45 and you had the principal of our high school <laughs> on the 45 yeah like, yeah that's right norm schneider yeah you know the, the thing with us it was it was we were the only band and just to you know pat my own back at, at, at 16 at 15 years old that we were going and playing in clubs in berkeley and in san francisco that you couldn't get into until you were 16 like keystone berkeley first time I, we played keystone berkeley opening for a band called the payolas and Paola's had a guitar player who named Bob Rock, who went on to become like a huge producer. Went on to become Bob Rock. Yeah. Went on to become Bob Rock. I don't think he was Bob Rock at the time, but okay. he was like Bob Yenovitz or something. Right. I have no idea. But so we were going out and playing clubs and then coming back to science class. Right. right. And so I think that was kind so of. So you're like actually the playing a club in Berkeley. That you're not allowed to go to. On a Wednesday night or <laughs> yeah. something. And you're coming back on Thursday morning and you're showing up for class. And you're like, look at all these schlucks. Oh, yeah. I'm a fucking rock star. <laughs> well, I don't, well, what am I doing in here? No. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Which is good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I never, you know, it's funny. I never felt that I was, I, I certainly personally never felt that I was a rock star. I felt like I was playing in a band with a bunch of rock stars. I mean, uh -huh. you know Adam Molinar. Yeah. I've always looked up to Adam I wouldn't say so much Eric Eppel. I don't know if, if you know the, the Eric, you know the same people. You know Adam Molinar. Mo, Molinar's Mexico Lindo. Yeah, oh yeah. my god. We used to rehearse. We used to play in the basement. We used to rehearse in the basement of this restaurant. Mm. We took the entire thing and made it blue. We had somehow got this a bunch of free light blue carpet we put on the ceiling, on the walls, and everything. It looked like we were playing in a, in a soundproof fishbowl. <laughs> and um, I still hear people from people that I don't, I haven't talked to in, in more years than I would care to admit. Like I saw you guys in the basement of Molinar's Mexico Lindo. Wow. People that I that I didn't, people that I never even knew that I. Knew. Yeah. 
But um, yeah, Mueller is Mexico Lindo. And you know my cologne as well. Yeah, yeah. What, what kind of music were you guys playing? Better? Was it rock and roll? Was it heavy metal? It was. It was. It was at that time was it was rock and roll. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we had a female singer, mm-hmm. and uh, I think there was, we were trying to be some kind of a, a Pat Benatar band who Hyland. was a rock star. Yeah. Terry's amazing. Yeah. Have you seen Terry lately? No. She looks amazing. I bet. Better than she's ever looked. Oh, my goodness. We were actually going to do a truant reunion show that Tommy Moffat was trying to put together. Wow. A couple of years ago. And so I was into it. Tommy and <laughs> Tommy and Adam and Eric Eppel and I all got together. You know Eric Eppel. Uh-huh. I barely know Eric Eppel, but I do know Adam. People that know Eric barely know Eric. Barely know Eric. Mm-hmm. He's a great guy. He's really funny. <laughs> okay. So we got together at Tommy's house, and Eric's like, I'm going to be a little late. I have to stop off and buy a car. And we just... Because he was walking. It was uh-huh. really weird, but that was Eric. But he's a great guy. Um, we actually got together and started working on stuff. And Terry lives in Texas. She's a teacher. She's married to a principal. Wow. And so um, at the last minute, she called and said, I, can't, I haven't sung in, in 25 years. I can't do it. Oh, so, you know, Terry. We're still trying to talk her into it. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Please do it, Terry. Please support. do it. But, yeah. Well, so that's the that's joint. Yeah. You guys did, there was a show that we were telling Brenna about earlier today. There was a show called TV20 Dance Party. TV20 was led by a guy named Jim Gabbard, and he's like a Bay Area media legend. Right. Mm -hmm. Bought this TV station, and he did all these revolutionary things on the TV station. One of them was, he did like a Soul Train American Bandstand type show that went from high school to high school to high school. And everywhere they went, if there was a band in that high school that could play a song, they'd bring them up on stage and have them play a song. And there were some, you know, there were some okay bands that were around, and there were some bands that were not that great that would show up, but Truant went on there and kicked ass. So you guys left in your wake at Hogan a bunch of fans wow. who were, we couldn't, you couldn't play music at Hogan and not still hear about Truant. Wow. For years afterwards. Then you were in Cry Wolf. Right. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it, it's what happened basically was um, after I left Truant, I joined another band in town called Audio. Oh, that's right. right, Audio, and with Jeff Berger and Paul uh-huh. Friend and all those guys, Dave Saker. Dave Saker. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just say Saker, and you just start laughing. Yeah. You know, Saker. And so, um, still around, still yeah, at it. He's yes, he. You know what? And he hasn't changed a bit. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good thing necessarily, yeah. but you know, it's like Slash, he's still wearing that top hat. Yeah, you yeah. know, Dave is like still, <laughs> still at it. He's still doing the thing that he was doing back in 1983. Uh-huh. I love the guy. But, I do too. Um, Hair, same length. Not afraid of Lycra. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And you know, it's, spandex is hard to pull off when she did a certain age, yeah, you know, and, but he's, he's tagging at yeah. it, you know, he's not going to give up. Dave um, hit that certain mm-hmm. age, like he's always 15 years older than us. Yeah. Yeah. He's like Mick Mars then. He like, is. He really I'm is. I'm old, like, but I'm playing the guitar. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show up and whoop everybody's ass, and we're like, Jesus, look at this guy. Yeah. And still at it. Wow. Still yeah. after it. So, anyway. I'm going to just for Dave to get up on stage and start yelling at all the audience to get off of his lawn. You know? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> kids! Hold this guitar by the bed yeah. and shake it. Better. And you never throw the paper all the way to the door. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to kick your ass. You little <laughs> So, <clears throat> do you guys have an AARP discount here? I know. Yeah. I shouldn't be laughing, you know, because I'm I'm probably, I'm undoubtedly older than everybody. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah, right. We're talking I mean, about the legacy you left behind. Yeah. I know. High school that we graduated right. from thirty years ago. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, please. We know the Where funny thing. I'll tell you the the only the, not that this is directly can be relatable to us, but true it mm-hmm. is. Tommy Moffat actually sent me a um, an article from a book about Eddie Van Halen. That uh, all these with all these different quotes from different rock stars, mm-hmm. and one of which was Billy Joe Armstrong. And Billy Joe Armstrong, in the book, he talked about how his first band was called Truant, and they used to play Van Halen covers and Ozzy covers and that kind of thing. And I thought, and I was reading this, going, "Wait, this isn't this isn't make this is our life. It's not his. I mean, but this yeah. is strange." Well, Tommy Moffat. Um, for those that don't know, Tommy was one of the guitar players in Truant. And he was a couple of years older than us, too. But his mom worked at a restaurant called Terry's mm-hmm. in Vallejo with Billy Joe Armstrong's mom. Oh, I didn't know that. Billy Joe Armstrong used to be, his mom used to take him to all of our truant shows when he was like 13, 14 years old. Wow. And when, oh boy. when truant <laughs> broke up, 
He asked his mom if he could ask Tommy's mom if they could change their name or if they can the call their name band of their band Truant. Truant. Wow. Yeah. And now he's in Green Day and I'm, uh-huh. I'm working for it. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the so, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes, he is. Crazy. I'm in the I'm in the Delwood Street and Vallejo Hall of Fame, I think. But that's close. Well, that's, that's a really good thing to <laughs> So... What happened in audio in the years between Truant and Cry Wolf? We were playing clubs and, and doing the thing in San Francisco and Oakland and playing the Omni and that kind of thing. And so Dave Saker went off to join another band called Flame, and our singer left the band. He was in two bands at once, which is unheard of at the time. Now, mm-hmm. if you're not in like seven bands, then, there's, then you're a slacker. So. Yeah. And so Derek Davis is his name, and he's in a band now called Babylon AD, which is the band that he was if you've ever heard him. So he was the band that he was in at the time. Yeah. And um, they've been together all that whole time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They were called the Persuaders at the time, and then they they changed their name to Babylon AD when I did at some point, but I guess they just did the Persuaders. Uh-huh. Very cool. I know. <laughs> so audio was kind of falling apart. The last show that we played was opening for a band called Heroes. Or actually, Heroes opened for us, which became Crywolf. Mm-hmm. And so... As luck would have it, after that show, their bass player quit. They remembered me from the show, from being an audio, and just randomly called me up. And this is at a time when I was just, I had an offer to get a job at Radio Shack if I cut my hair. You know, I'm like 17 years old, I'm sitting there going, no money. I'm not having, no money. I'm having a midlife crisis at 17, right? I'm like, <laughs> what am I going to, am I going to pursue this dream of mine and continue to play music with my shoulder length, floppy, weird hair? Probably not unlike it is now. Or am I going to grow up? And get a job at Radio Shack. Well, as fate would have it, I uh, got a call from Tim, the singer in Heroes, which became Cry Wolf. Joined that band and moved to L.A. about six months later. What year is this? Thank God. This This was in 86. So this is just before the peak of that whole L.A. hair metal band scene. I mean, like that's what was happening right Well, you know, it's funny because, I mean, we were... You know, as a Bay Area band, the Bay Area scene wasn't really that great. And so, mm-hmm. But we had this woman that we were working with who wanted to manage the band. So she invited us down on a weekend to come to L.A. And I've never been there. I've never seen – I mean, I've been to L.A., but I've never seen, like, the rocks. The scene, yeah. You've never been to Sunset. I had not been to Sunset. Not been to Disneyland. So I come down. So we come down. We, we, we drive. We get here about 1130. She's like, well, let's go down to Hollywood. I'm like – it's eleven thirty. It's eleven thirty. Are you kidding? Like everyone's asleep one in the by end. now. <laughs> so we go down to what was then the when then Gazaris, and uh-huh. you know, as as the trip was, there were so many people out on the street, so many bands handing out flyers that there were there were people having to walk around the traffic, around the cars parked on Sunset, and a police helicopter was shining the searchlight down, telling everybody to get back and break it up. And I was like. This is where we got to be. Yeah. This, this is, is where awesome. It is. Yeah. I've seen. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we did. I mean, we moved down soon after that. So you looked up at a police helicopter light and thought, fuck Radio Shack. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And look at him now. Yeah. 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 That Radio Shack. <laughs> you got survived. That's right. Yes. That's foresight if I ever saw it. That's, that's right. 30 years later, this company's going bankrupt. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so we moved to L.A. and then, you know, just the same thing. We were playing the clubs and, and we had an opportunity actually to go to Japan. I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. The funny thing was playing in L.A. at that time, some of the bands that we saw, I remember seeing Guns N' Roses at the Whiskey sure. in mm-hmm. front of like 60, yeah. 60 people. Mm-hmm. And they were great. But if somebody somebody would have said they're going to be the biggest band in the world in two years, I would right. believe. If even that, right? Like eighty seven yeah. is when they stuck. They got on that tour mm-hmm. with the Cult. Yeah, and it was like, oh, we're opening for the Cult. Yeah, not anymore. We're right. We're now the headline act. Now, well, you know, it's funny because we had a band that that I that I partially wrote called Heart of the Jungle, and I remember seeing them. I was like, oh, they have a jungle song too, but ours is going to be way bigger than that. <laughs> 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 no, like, yeah, maybe not so much, but. Um, you no, they had a welcome to yours, and that yeah. was the problem. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> the so, <laughs> yeah, but, and so, I mean, Guns Roses was great, you know. But they, um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the the scene was just massive, and it was huge. And and we had an opportunity to go to Japan as an unsigned band. We actually made a demo tape mm-hmm. that we turned into a bunch of cassette tapes that we would hand out to anybody that signed our mailing list. And one of those cassette tapes is a four song demo. You can still find it on eBay. But Force on Demo made its way to a promoter or made its way to a, a reviewer for a magazine in England, a guy named Kel Hellraiser, wrote this incredible review about this demo tape. And from that led to the tape 
being picked up by a promoter in Japan mm. that brought us over for a couple of weeks and to play in Japan as an unsigned band. Mm. So, you know, I didn't I didn't actually believe we were going until we were sitting in the plane. And I, like, I thought so there's had to be something wrong with it. Yeah, there's a catch. There's a catch. What is a catch? Yeah. And so, Guns N' Roses is staying behind. I know. We're yeah, I know. We're going to Japan. I know. And so we, we, so we went to Japan, and we ended up getting a record deal with Epic Sony after our first show. Hmm. Wow. And so we came back, recorded our album, and then we went back and did a tour of Japan for a month in September of, of 89. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were over there. We were, we were touring the same the same like circuit as Black Sabbath, and so we we're playing the same places as Black Sabbath. It was crazy. The, just, the audience there was just amazing. Wow! But we were, but we would do that, and then come back home, and then hand out flyers on this trip. Right. You know, so it was very humbling. It really kept us grounded. You know, yeah. it's like we didn't really have the opportunity to to really think a whole lot of ourselves if we still had to come back and try to and hand, out, and hand out flyers. Were you, were you guys treated like kind of rock stars in Japan? Oh, yeah. Because I know cause they're not used to seeing so many <clears throat> white oh, faces yeah. over there. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. The, the second, the, actually, the second time we went there, somebody called the hotel that we were staying in to find out if we'd arrived yet, apparently. And uh, by the time we got there, there was about 1,500 people outside the hotel. Wow. And, you know, after Extreme, Nuno Betancourt moved over to Japan, and he was like, I'm staying here. Yeah. Well, there's a band, there was a band in the Bay Area called Cacophony. Marty Friedman is a guitar player. He was actually the guitar player in Megadeth for a, for a while. Mm-hmm. And I remember that band. They're, they had a drummer named Kenny Stavropoulos. Man, oh, yeah. Kenny was, was great. Kenny was a great drummer. He was really from the um, Terry Bozio kind of vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, was, he, was he even really looked like Terry Bozio dogs. a little yeah. bit. He still, who's he playing lately? I saw so he's, I mean, he played with Y&T maybe for a little while or oh. something. Or, anyway. And so we met Marty Friedman over there. Mm-hmm. In '89, and he had just moved there. That's a big fucking deal. You met Marty Friedman over there. Yeah, he had just moved there. Yeah, and so it was. This is before he was in Megadeth, actually, because mm-hmm. he's lived there, and his wife is Japanese, and he's just he's like fully immersed in the Japanese culture. Uh-huh. And it was it was it was unbelievable. It was just a great experience. Wow, you know, they're very very different than the culture in the United States. They have vending machines on the street that sell beer. Yeah, that's great. Germany has that too. Thank Do God. they really? Oh yeah. I've been in Germany. I didn't see. I didn't notice it's not that. Everywhere. It's not as common as it used to be. So yeah. all the access powers sell beer on the street. What's going on there? Yeah. No, well, anyway, <laughs> well, um, our manager asked his kid that was there. It's like, like because they still have a drinking age. Mm-hmm. So why don't you just go up and buy beer out of a vending machine? You know, why don't enough. you do it? Yeah. And their response was, "Well, we're not supposed to." Yeah. I'm like, that would never fly back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My buddy left his iPhone out just recently, a couple a uh, couple months ago. Left his iPhone out, and they're like, "Oh." It's supposed to belong to somebody. And he got it back. Like, he really? got it back to him. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll find this guy. No problem. Like, well, you know, it's really funny because, and you probably know this from, from being there, spending some time there, the new movie that I'm writing right now takes place in Tokyo. Oh. And and one of the reasons why they wanted to take, it's a big zombie movie. <clears throat> and they wanted to be in a place where there wasn't a lot of weapons, so they had to use their hands or knives or blades or whatever yeah. right. to fight back. Yeah. Because everybody just got gun control. Them, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, yeah. where would where, where be the perfect place? And I was like, well, Tokyo. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, the cops and do it's an have guns. Place to shoot. People don't know the cops actually do have guns because <clears throat> yeah. they never have to use them. Right. You know? So, anyway, I mean, yeah. Well, if, if any of those Japanese like kung fu movies are made in the United States, it'd be like Pistols of Fury, and the fight yeah. would be like ah! five seconds long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It feels like, yeah. <laughs> So, so when you were over there, you guys made videos, and because yeah. I remember we saw videos over here. Oh yeah, we were on. We we well, we ended up coming back. Um, we had the number one video on Japanese MTV for a while, yeah. and so we when we came back here, we ended up getting a record deal small with a smaller label. Mm-hmm. And this is granted, this is in like late '89, and the whole hair metal thing that we were part of. That's when things really started kind of falling yeah. apart. Yeah. You know, because you could look at, a ma- like, you open up a magazine we're in at the time, like Hit Parade or Metal Edge or something like that, and you could pluck me out of a Cry Wolf picture, stick me in a Firehouse, mm-hmm. and take some guy from Firehouse yeah. and put him in. Everybody had a this, similar look. Yeah. And it's like, and mm-hmm. at, we were all looking at this going, it's, it's, it's not going to last. There's a bubble. There's a bubble. There's a bubble. Yeah. 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 We would, it was, yeah. And so we, we ended up putting our album out in the United States in 90, and we toured the States three times. And we were on MTV here for a while. And it was great. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. But at the same time, it's like, I remember because our singer Tim was like, we should just cut our hair and, and like make a video with cheerleaders that are wearing black. And I was <laughs> like, that's never going to work. And then it smells like teen spirit. Right. Right. We're all like, <laughs> miss it again. Yeah. Like Metallica just cut their hair off. I right? know, yeah, right. Exactly. 
<laughs> a good friend of mine is a, a guy named Mike Inez, who's a, a bass player in Allison Chains. Mm-hmm. And he was an Aussie for a while. And the, the, Allison Chains did an unplugged show right when Metallica cut their hair. And so on his face, yes. he wrote, friends don't let friends get friends' haircuts. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <That's true>. Yeah. <laughs> so when you were um, in the midst of this thing and you were at its peak, mm-hmm. could you really look over the edge and foresee the, because I was still busy with, I want to get my hair <clears> even longer. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't see the bubble. Well, you know, the bubble to me really came with Pearl Jam and Nirvana, especially Nirvana. Like when Nirvana came out, it just everybody felt it. Yeah. It was like, this is not, we're no longer cool. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and so. It's like disco, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. The exactly. lights went on and everything changed. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, yeah. I, I, I liken it to a story that I read. They were talking about, I think it was like Bobby Darren or somebody like that. There was a star in the, in the mid, early 1960s. Mm-hmm. And then the Beatles came out. Yeah. yeah, and then all of a sudden oh, he was like, music. "Yeah, Same thing. Yes. it they was like it all. all of a sudden yeah. it was like this is no longer cool." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of what happened to to rock at that time. And I think what the problem was that a lot of bands didn't really know how to evolve. When you look at bands like Warrant, for example, mm-hmm. now Warrant was a million; they sold millions of records. Mm-hmm. And a band like Pearl Jam, and I I still to this day absolutely love that first Pearl Jam album. Mm-hmm. And there was a noticeable difference, I think, in the emotional quality of the Pearl Jam record to the Warrant record. And I, those guys were friends of mine. Yeah. And, you know, but but it just like Cherry Pie and then Jeremy. Right. right. There was like people got, I think yeah. they got tired of everything being so like, you know, rock and roll was really based around guys that your parents would be afraid if you brought them home. Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> and then it reached a point where bands like, I don't want to say yes, because that just make me sad. But it's <laughs> <laughs> like, man's like Firehouse or whatever. And they would take these, they were taking pictures in these magazines of wearing, of like for the Christmas issue, wearing like Christmas pajamas. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, this is no longer the rebellious. Yeah. You know, this is yeah, no longer, yeah. they, it became like, we're the guys that you want to bring home to mom. And right. it's like, that's not rock and roll. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. not. We agree with you. Here's yeah. That's our show's definition of, of rock and roll, right? Here's yeah. th- that, that's it. Here's this guy, and it's like I'm, I'm not afraid of this dude anymore. Yeah, mm-hmm. his hair's long. There's a yeah. million of them. David Lee Roth did that. Yeah, you're, you're right. He, you're he, right. He softened them up, uh-huh. and, you know, and popping them up, and would do all silly stuff in glasses and just all and wear the glasses. And by yeah. the way, I'm going to cover some Louis Prima tunes, and right. everything's okay, Mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. and made it. So let's blame David Lee Roth. If you like the show, and you know you do, send us some pictures of your movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave a five-star rating and review. It helps with the show metrics, and it helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. Well, yeah, I'll tell you, there, you know how many David Lee Ross there were in L.A. at that oh time? Oh, my God. They got to be sure. murdered. Oh, there yeah. was just every single... Just band up and down the strip was just yeah. they were all trying to all the singers are trying to be David Lee Roth right yeah just like nowadays how every company wants to be the Uber of yeah you know yeah. croissant sandwiches or whatever yeah. every every band right there well we've got our David Lee Roth and yeah. then we have these four other guys but what makes our band different you yeah. know but everybody had the David we Lee really Roth. really rock yeah, yeah. <laughs> no no it's like no matter what you've heard we rock and then yeah. came Jeremy yeah and now mm. it's like Holy shit, that's an actual yeah. subject matter. Yeah. Now I have to be afraid of this. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and it was real and it was substantial. Yeah. So you're right. That is what happened. So bands, all of a sudden, this this change happened. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember there were so many bands, or so, you know, that were just just cursing the day that Nirvana came out. You mm-hmm. know, it's like they changed everything. We can't wait for everything to go back the way it was. And it's like, it's no, they're not going back. Right. You know, but but you do. You reach a point where. All right, we've heard that. That's like when Adam Sandler's trying to redefine himself and he's still trying to figure it out. Yeah. And the bands that survive through that time aren't the band they were then. You know, right. whatever they yeah. do, they've they you know, U two's changed several times and, and uh, Metallica has changed. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sure, yeah. over and over again. Any of any act that's lasted that long. So now that 
rock and roll not today, at least from my point of view, because I have a daughter. If Chris Brown shows up in my house, door gets slammed right in his face. <laughs> and I grab Brown and we go upstairs because that guy's rock and roll as fuck. You yeah. know, he's, he's got, biting bitches. He's got yeah. tattoos. Yeah. Yeah. Bitch now he's a full on blood too. So it's like, yeah. yeah. It's well, flaming. I mean, all all of that stuff plays in. That's what rock and roll is now. And look how different that is mm-hmm. through the scope of thirty years. Right. You know, where it was lycra and makeup on dudes to where Chris Brown is now. It's you have no idea other than you know about Radio Shack. You have no idea <laughs> where the music industry is going next because it just something will come up and it'll change and it'll pivot. Well, yeah. you know it's funny. You guys were just talking. You were just mentioning about um, things that are progressing, like things aren't moving forward or whatever. Like it just stopped, and then you started realizing, hey, oh my God, we're all similar. Yeah, right? The music yeah. is similar. You can just take a chord from that person or whatever. You can kind of hear oh, the yeah. same thing. It seems like hip hop is one of the only forms that's lasted as long as it's lasted, except for they've escalated, they've changed, they've kept moving forward with with new. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's right. You can be a guy with a first and last name and be a hip hop artist now. Yeah. And back then it was like, no, I have the mm-hmm. icy, 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 fresh freeze. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> icy, icy, come, why? Freeze. Come on, fresh Hello. freeze, yeah. Larry. <laughs> we know you're Larry. <laughs> no, 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 not in here. Yeah. Not in here. I'm icy, 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 I'm fresh MCI freeze. I'm MCI and fresh produce. That can work. Yeah, but you're right. It continues. It's Larry with three R's though. Right. Oh yeah. We see. I mean, you know, growing up in Vallejo, that. If I was in a I was in a rock band in high school, mm-hmm. but I still grew up on the Gap band, right? You sure. know, and you and couldn't the Hill Gap. Up in the no, Lowe. that was it. And you I were trying to get laid. And you would go yeah. to a party, and the Gap band would be on in the garage. Oh yeah, yeah. and I listened to Parliament and Funkadelic as much as I listened to sure. Van Halen sure. back then. You right, know? and so we were well versed in a lot of different kinds of music mm-hmm. and and had appreciation for it. Right, oh, and you guys really. practiced at Molinar's Mexico Lindo, which is in the ghetto. <laughs> 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 so you, yeah, it was uh, it, it was. Any generation of musician in any genre from Vallejo still had to be influenced by Sly Stone. Still had oh, yeah. to be influenced by Confunction. Mm-hmm. Right. Still had, you know, the influence the of everything that was around. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was what allowed everybody. I, as far as you guys had gotten, as you describe it, I remember, and I, the only, my hesitation in telling this story is I don't remember this guy's name, but there was a guy named James who lived in Beverly Hills, and he was a black guy, but he always wore an ACDC hat, and he was a rocker. And he had a VHS tape that had a bunch of Cry Wolf on it. I mean, the... Really? Yeah, the Barney Miller bass solo. <laughs> oh, yeah, the live stuff. Yeah, wow. I, I don't know where he got mm-hmm. it, but that's where I saw that. Hmm. So, what if he still has it? I get a copy. You weren't there that day. I know. Oh, my God. His name right. Because I don't even remember that that's... I want to say his name was James, but... James Early? No, it wasn't no. James Early, but there was this guy who lived in Beverly Hills, and our listeners who lived in Beverly Hills will remember. He was a rocker, and he wore like a corduroy hat, and it was an ACDC hat. So anybody who grew up in the hillside, tell us who that dude is, because somebody knows. Yeah. Um, wow. He was the one metalhead who had a Cry Wolf tape. Wow. And he played it. And I'm we impressed. saw it. And we were like, man, check this out. So that's how I even knew about that. Wow. The, the Barney Miller thing. Yeah. Wow. I'm impressed. His bass solo used to incorporate the theme from Barney Miller. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, exactly. What we used to do. We used to do and this, it rocked hard. <laughs> we do this whole breakdown thing in the middle, like all the so, like the solos. Our singer would kind of take a break or whatever, and we and I'd start off and I'd do a bass solo, and I would end it with that, mm-hmm. and then our drummer would kick into it and he he'd do something. He he'd come in with and then mm-hmm. then our guitar player would start with a with a whole horn part and he'd play the guitar on it, mm-hmm. and then the drums would stop and then he'd go off and do his guitar solo, and so. I mean, actually, started with a drum solo and then bass solo, and then we'd have a little solo session. So that was like always a big thing. And I remember some people going, like when we play in Japan, they're like, "I love that. What is that? You know, did you guys write that?" I'm like, "Oh, you don't have Barney Miller here." <laughs> 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 they thought so, they was giving it to him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's Bob James, actually. Oh, oh yeah, wrote the yeah. Barney Miller thing. Yeah, yeah I think Bob. so. Mm. That's deep knowledge there. 
Yeah. Good job. You know, I was a jazz head growing up. He wrote a lot of stuff. I think he wrote the theme from Taxi, too. No, yeah, you're right. That's yeah. Yeah, the Barney Miller thing. Maybe the, maybe it was Tom Scott or somebody. It might be Bob James. Okay. It might be. I think it was we'll because it there's up. a Rhodes. Isn't Google there a Rhodes that kicks in? Google, 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 Google yeah. yeah. But he did write the theme from Taxi. Well, you know, speaking of bass players, I'm going to throw this in real quick. I saw this thing lately of a, a recently from the NAMM show. It was mm. Steve Bailey and uh, Victor Wooten mm. playing with Carol Kay. Wow. Oh, wow. Carol Kay's a badass. Mm-hmm. To this day, she's a badass bass player. Yeah. And they were standing around watching her, and she was like, I mean, she's not as dexterous as sure. she dexter, once was. As, as she once was. Yeah. But, I mean, just the stuff she was coming up with, it's just like the the... the the choice of notes yes. and melody that Placement. I play, I'd just be going, mm-hmm. I was watching him going, she's just, what, she's like, you gotta be in her 80s She's now. from another place, yeah. 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 But that's always been the thing about her. Yes. Not, not just her dexterity, but her ability to make a choice that was just so, like, what in the Just hell? better. Yeah. 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 Whatever you bring, she's like, that's good, but it ought to be is here. That, is that yeah. the money from Wrecking Crew? Yes. 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 She's gone? No, 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 she's still around. The movie was Ham Show. Oh, okay, okay. But she, um, you know, just the good vibrations. Yeah. For yeah. crying out loud. Got what right. the hell was that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, she played on a lot of the, the, the Beach Boys stuff. All of it. She's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's she's absolutely amazing. Songs. So, um, I might cut this out, but I heard she's crazy. Part. Yeah. She's crazy? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I, uh, she's crazy badass on the bass. That's all I know. She is crazy badass on the bass. Um... Yeah, she's that would happen to bass players. Yeah, you know, uh, speaking of bass players, um, let's see. I gave you the list of bass players who have been on our show. Yeah, one Derek of them was Derek Jones. Derek Jones. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's been on our show. I think he's been on our show twice. We did two shows with him. We only put one show up though. Oh, okay. You knew you got to get on the show if you're doing bass players from Vallejo. Was Charles Quinn? I absolutely do have to get Charles Quinn because he was. Yeah, he was like a bass legend walking yeah. around. You know Charles Quinn. Mm. He was he graduated in my class from Hogan High and he was just, he joined the army. Yeah, he joined the army. He's oh, probably he's living in LA. Yeah. Oh, is he living yeah. in LA? Yeah. I think. Wow. He's living down here somewhere. I see him on Facebook. I'm yeah, yeah. The guy was just in high school. I mean just slap bad. Just mm. complete bad. Lewis Johnson. Absolutely badass. Yeah. In high school. So I want to get back to, to your story. Oh, bad Earl Brown was. Earl Brown was like, Oh yeah, I'm okay with Charles <laughs> Quinn. Anyway. So you're in LA and, and really that's the triple A of that era's rock bands, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. like, you know, that's where the best ones are going to come from. Maybe it's Def Leppard coming from somewhere else, but, you know, you still had to Yeah, here. most of the proven yeah. ground was yeah. here. You had to come here and cut your teeth. Right. be bad here. Well, the thing about being here, too, is because you're you're moving to an area, if you're a band, and you're in, you know, you're in Boise, and you're like, right. we're going to move to L.A., and we're going to make it big, and you're coming here with 3,000 other bands. I mean, there was right. a music connection. Magazine said that like rock bands at one period of time there were three thousand bands in all, and for you to get, <laughs> and Kinko's was like we're making tons of money. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's the gold rush guys got. I got shovels. Yeah, that, that started oh, pay yeah. to play. Yeah. 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 They were like, Shoot, let's make money off these mm-hmm. people. Let me ask you a quick question. You were about to, keep keep the question no, no, no. the answer. You were about to answer him, but I was just thinking about that. As soon as you said that. Can you imagine how much more popular you would have been had there been Facebook and all that stuff today, Twitter and et cetera? It's just a very different world now. Or you know? how or, much more there would have been to cut through. Um, because one of the right. things about Cry Wolf was that you guys did sort of surge ahead. And I don't know what it was like down here. I wasn't mm-hmm. down here. But if you were from Vallejo, mm-hmm. during the Cry Wolf surge, you know, you, you heard about it. And it was mm-hmm. like, dude, they're doing it. They're mm-hmm. down there doing it. Yeah. Whereas another band who was sitting down here was like, yeah, I saw those motherfuckers yesterday. They were handing out flyers just like us. Yeah. So. Yeah, so there was a certain, you know, when we, I remember we played up in the Bay Area, like before we went to Japan the second, I think it was the second time. And BAM Magazine mm-hmm. was huge at the time. And so all the bands, uh, you know, advertise BAM Magazine mm-hmm. and they take a quarter page ad out or whatever. We took a six page ad out. Wow. Whew. And. For these two shows that we were playing at the Stone, not and a sixth of a page, yes, a sixth <laughs> page. Yeah, it was like yeah. a classified That's They ad. invested in their career. That's yeah, smart. yeah. Like and that. so we took a six-page full. Even when fucking uh, Eli, 
Manning uh, retires, he only takes a one-page ad out. Yeah. You guys yeah, took out like six, six pages. pages. Yeah, but what magazine was he in, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never mind the details. details. Not kidding. He'll always worry about the details. <laughs> but so what we did, because we had this, I don't know if you remember this, but Craig Wolfie had these t-shirts made, and we used to have these these things on stage were silhouettes of our faces mm-hmm. that were like six foot or eight foot high and, you know, four foot wide. Mm-hmm. Basically, a sheet of plywood, uh-huh. and so <laughs> that we have up on stage of just our face. It was all black and just the white face, almost like a like a Beatles esque kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I came up with that because I took our demo tape and I put it on a copy machine and I shrunk it down like really sm- as small as I can get it the, uh-huh. the images, and then I enlarged it as long as I can get it. It was large I can get it, and they were all really and you just distorted pixelated. the hell out of it. Yeah. yeah, and so I took some white out. And I went around like where our faces were in a Sharpie and I went around and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Make this into a t-shirt. This is an old school oh, graphic. This is way, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I used to make stencil or make flyers with a stencil because that's what you had to do or letter set letters. Uh, right? yeah. Copy machine. <laughs> and so, and so anyway, so we, this ad that we'd, we'd have these, these big silhouettes on, on stage. The ad was each one of our faces was an entire page with nothing else on it. Just our faces. Wow. And in the center of it was the ad for the show and it had our logo and the, the two shows that we were playing. Yeah. And I remember when the, we were playing a Friday night at the Stone and a Saturday night at the Omni in Oakland. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Big was playing on Saturday night at the Stone mm-hmm. and they canceled their show and came to ours. Wow. <laughs> and that's when, that's when I was like, the first time I was like, this is, we're doing, shit, we're doing something different now. Yeah. Cause they were, this is when they, they were, so, and Mr. Big was already, Mr. Big was, he was huge at this time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so they, they canceled their show and we came to ours. And so that's when I was like, all right, so we're doing something. I don't know what we're doing, but we're doing something. But, um, yeah, that was fun. Billy Sheehan took the night off to come and watch you. Yes, that he happened. Did. happened. Yes, he did. That and happened. the matter of fact, there's, there's pictures of on Facebook of, of us standing backstage with Billy Sheehan and Paul Gilbert and Pat Pay, and that's from that show. Yeah. Huh. It's backstage yeah. of, the, of the Omni when they came to see us play. And so they weren't selling. They didn't sell any tickets. Wow! Yeah, wow. that's the only time that ever happened. It's kind of like when Guns N' Roses open for Great White. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guns N' Roses open for Great White. Yeah, they did it. They yeah, they opened for Great White. Wasn't the other way around in a terrible travesty. No, Guns no, no Roses the, open that for... early, early, early on, yeah. early oh, on they did. Okay. And Jack and and um, Jack, not Jack White, Jack uh, Russell. Russell, yeah. From Great White was asking, "How's how's music changed?" He's like, "Well, I don't think Guns N' Roses is going to be opening this for opening for us anymore." But yeah, well, so that, they, that goes to we, we were talking about. You guys just interviewed Angelo from Fishbone, yeah. And I was telling you guys that when I used to go see Fishbone back in the early '80s, that the Chili Peppers used to open up for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. So uh, that's Fishbone's awesome. legendary. Oh, that's my boy. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the shit. Yeah, I mean, but at the time, Chili Peppers needed to open up for Fishbone. Yeah, you know, right, right then. But they actually had happened. a bunch of Scott songs that people don't know about. But yeah, <laughs> you know. But you know. When it comes to, uh, it's not just a matter of this band opening for that band, but the timing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that right. was that was Guns N' Roses in their emergence. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. You know, they were coming out swinging, and you know, poor Great White, it just happened to be. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, we played a show a couple of years ago when Cry Wolf still We played a show with Great White. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, Jack, Jack Russell, he's still, he's great. He's still tagging at it. You know, he's had some health issues, but you yeah. know, he hasn't given up. But the, the thing about Guns N' Roses specifically, in my opinion, was you had Metallica, which was a metal band, mm-hmm. and this is back in the in the early days, earlier days of Metallica, like mm-hmm. pre nineteen eighty seven, and then you had Poison, yeah. and so Poison was a glammy, poppy mm-hmm. kind of band, a lot of makeup, a lot of hairspray. Then you had Metallica with a lot of you know acne. anger. We're not wearing <laughs> makeup. A lot of acne. Guys. Yeah. yeah. And so then, of acne. then you had Guns N' Roses came in, and this was a band that bridged that. Band. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you had Metallica yes. fans looked at Guns N' Roses as just a kick-ass rock and band. Went, yeah, that's a band we can I do like. that. Poison fans looked at Guns N' Roses and they went, "They're glammy enough for us, and they're, right. they're melodic enough." And so Guns N' Roses came in and they bridged that gap between them. They took both fans from both bands, mm-hmm. and so you know, and then they sold fourteen million records, or whatever. Axel had a style though, I think. He had an interesting he was different. Yeah. He wasn't quite as flamboyant and dressed. I don't think it's gonna work in A C D C now though. Yeah, yeah. You know about that. Yeah. 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 He's in A C D C? Yeah. He's he's, he's filling Brian, in. Yeah. yeah. Or whatever. Whatever's gonna filling happen. in for the Brian Johnson, the singer from A C D C has has problems with his ears. Mm. And I I I've I've heard it's because 
um, they play so loud that it's an ear, it's an air pressure thing. Mm. And his doctor basically told him said if you fin- continue this tour, you're gonna you're gonna completely lose your hearing. Mm. And so he had to, he had to to they were gonna cancel this the tour that they're doing, but you know everybody's got to make money, so they were gonna have a fill in singer, and that's apparently Axl Rose. And he, he it makes has that no pasta. sense to me at all. He actually has that. That's hard. So doesn't, I know. It wasn't Brian yeah, Johnson the fill in to begin with? I mean, when he yeah. I, he he drove the bus. It was something and like, was like that. No, yeah. I know all the tunes. It's cool. Yeah. Keep going. Let me ask you this: So, Axl Rose is not the guy to do that job. I don't think. No, I mean, absolutely. He, not. he doesn't have the singing opinion. chops anymore. Um, who does? Who's the guy that you would rather see in there? You know, I Adam Lambert would probably do that. Oh yeah, well. Well, he's doing Queen. He's, he's, queen. Queen. Oh, he's busy. Yeah. He's yeah, he's busy. He's got the chops he's for Queen. Because ACDC's no joke. ACDC's yeah. more... Yeah, it's yeah, up there. He's, yeah. got the, he's, got, he, he's got the vocal ability, but he doesn't, doesn't have the grasp. That's what I I'm thinking. You know, about. It's, it's, well, why does ACDC pick? Because you got to know that Axel's going to be an idiot. But I mean, I mean, he's he was a draw. A, is he? Yeah, Axel Rose is a draw. Man, Did you guys see that meme that said, Welcome to the jungle, we've got tons of cake? And you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> current picture yeah. of Axel Rose, Did he's he enormous. Now? Is he? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a pretty big guy. Yeah, now. he's not in player shape. That's no. for sure. Wow. He's gonna have to he's gonna have to hit the treadmill for a while. I mean you can have Axel Rose and he's, he maybe he's a bit of a draw, <laughs> but you can have Frankie Perez go out there and A C D C is a draw. And this guy Frankie Perez that plays in Vegas, he can sing every song. It doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't, yeah, no, it doesn't no, matter no. at all. But there's guys who can do that job. I pick Axel because you know it's like they, pick, think they need to start a front end. It's like picking fine. Scott Weiland to be in your band. You know it's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. Axel's going to be a problem. Look, he just got back together with his band and he left. Look, yeah. man, you just get an actuary and you sit him down with his table and you give him his computer and you go, all right, just tell me how many shows we can do. Was ACD having trouble selling tickets before it all melts? You know, I just I can't I can't imagine that they're. That they're having trouble selling tickets at all. I, I, but I don't. Well, they're not I mean, now. But if they get a guy who's untested and uh, you know unknown, even if you got the guy, a guy who Miles could Kennedy. do it, who could have oh, yeah. the rasp and Miles has Kennedy the talent, can do it. he's, he's, he's not going to be a draw. Probably well, just like, go do it right this now. is like Queen. If you didn't, if you didn't watch American Idol, you'd know mm-hmm. Lender. Right. Yeah. Well, you know true. I mean? But well, that was the catalyst for yeah. for for. for the, we just Queen. we just saw that Miles Kennedy. All right. <laughs> See that? Chris, a different the world's problem. Different kind of voice mm-hmm. yeah. than Brian Johnson has. Nobody sounds like Brian Johnson. I think they don't on purpose. Yeah, but you know, it's. <laughs> I mean, he's got I'm Brian Johnson. It's got a certain. <laughs> yeah. It's got a certain. I mean, you know, everything from "Shook Me All Night Long" to "Back in Black." Mm-hmm. And everything since it's been. You know, it came out in 1980, and, yeah. and it was just the biggest record at the time. Mm-hmm. And huge, and it's got a certain, definitely it's got a certain vibe to it. His voice has got a certain vibe to it. But um, Steve and and I, the guitar player from Crywolf, um, the other night we were at a show with our uh, the last singer of Crywolf. We had a female singer named Dinah. And Dinah's in an ACDC tribute band, all female nice. ACDC tribute band. All right. And um, what's it called? Called Fund Her Struck. <laughs> the man fun her what and she fun, no, her, fun struck. her struck struck and Dinah's oh, back. struck she's yeah, like thunderstruck thunder oh thunderstruck no no, no that was the ACD that's the fun words her struck so the fund. her is kind of no fun oh fun and her it's thunderstruck thunder with her because it's an all female band it's female oh okay because that's what I love about a tribute band you mm-hmm. can take the you know material oh, okay, yeah, material yeah, but, yeah, but you always have to name it something that's a play on whatever the brand is like there's a, my favorite is there's a, in the Bay Area, there's a uh, Ramones cover band, all female, and they're called the Hormones. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. See, there, that's, that's exactly it. That's, uh, well, yeah, we, we have a whole conversation about tribute bands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I played, I played a few shows with um, an, an Eagles tribute band oh. called The Long Run, of course. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, honestly, probably one of the best bands I've ever, I've ever seen. Wow! Yeah, I mean they—they're one of the they most. They nail it. What's that? They nail it vocally. And everything. They nail everything. Everything is nailed. Great musicians, great vocals, mm-hmm. and with a, with a real respect for for the Eagles. For the but material. they're the most professional band I've ever I've mm-hmm. ever seen. Wow! Mm-hmm. All right, and and we played the last the couple of the last Cry Wolf shows was playing with Foreigner. Wow! Mm-hmm. And at the time, I was like Foreigner, and still, I mean, the, they just had it down. I mean, yeah. they're they right. Foreigner, so mm-hmm. but um, just everything was just like. Totally pro and playing with the long one was kind of like that with me. It opened up a whole different. And did way you actually sing like Timothy B. Schmidt's parts and yeah. everything? Yeah. 
and all, and Randy Meisner and all that that really high stuff. Yeah. Some of that stuff is like it's like I didn't know I could do it. You're like you're the bass player, man. You need to Randy. Randy's, Randy's like, oh, I'm not doing it tonight. That we're not playing that song. I'm like, no, we have to do it. Yeah. I know. But well, like yeah. like you know, song one of these nights. Yeah. Uh, that background hit that that, uh-huh. that Meisner hit was yeah. just un- I mean, I don't know how he did. It's like a dog whistle. Yeah. I mean, but so yeah, we all try to hit it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could. Do, I'll do it. It's if I could do the notes. It's that's wow. the note. I'd say it's done. <laughs> Damn, that wasn't done. Yeah, but I'm actually. You know what? The, the just I know we jump around in subjects, but man, I feel so bad for Randy Meisner. Yeah, you know his. The I don't know if you if you did heard the story, but um, within the last few weeks, Randy Meisner, Randy Meisner, who's the original bass player in the Eagles, mm-hmm. he left. Before um, not the before the long run came out in 1979, so he, he this is early on in the There's a great documentary on Netflix. Oh, oh really? Oh, it's two part. Really? Beautiful. Yeah. It's three. Yeah, it's three. The Eagles three documentary. Yeah. It's so good. Oh yeah, it's, check it's that two out. full documentaries. The yeah. first one is about the Eagles the up to that time. point. Yeah, and then the second one was about when the Eagles decided let's put it back. together. They basically shut it, it down. With Glenn Fry's like, we get off the stage. I'm going to kick your. This having a fight while they're playing. While they're on stage. Yeah. While they're on stage. Yeah. Glenn Fry's like three more songs i'm gonna kick your yeah. ass <laughs> so but randy meisner um so he when he left the band he kind of fell into some bad health mm-hmm. drinking a lot he came down mm-hmm. he had problems with it he was hospitalized a few times because of it um not doing well for the past few years and he was married to this to this woman and this is just recently within the last 10 years i think they were married um Police were called out to the house a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, domestic abuse on, on both of their parts. It's just not a good situation. Um, and a few weeks ago, apparently, she was digging a gun out of a closet in a soft shell <laughs> case. Uh-oh. And she pulled the gun out. Something in the case oh, was a, snagged the trigger. Enough, spurs that were in the case shifted in the case, blew the top of the of the the case off, shot her head. Mm. Or they shot her in the wow. head. And so, it's, no, oh, killed her oh, immediately. As yeah. a matter of, and so there was a lot of suspicion around. And he called nine one one, and the, the fire, fire police, fire police, fire police. No, it was a chief. Fire police. Them too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, fire trucks came and whatever, and they saw it. And so then, you know, when somebody gets their head shot off, there's a lot of suspicion with oh, the spouse. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. But she was apparently um, a kind of a paranoid person, so she had a lot of cameras inside their house, mm. and the whole thing was caught on tape. Oh, good. Oh, Jesus. Wow. What? And sad. It's yeah. Sad. It's sad. I really feel bad for the guy. He was such an unbelievably talented mm. bass player. He was. And yeah. singer. Yeah. You know, to me, he was like, it's kind of like Michael Anthony from Van Halen. You know, mm. he was like their secret weapon. Yeah, he yeah. really was. Yeah. yeah. The thing about Michael Anthony, too, is they just didn't even... Call him. What, what's going on there? Uh, That's just a lot of hate and anger yeah. over just decades to do that. So, <sighs> man, I don't know. That's yeah. that's really sad. I've met all those guys and they've all been really cool. Alex is one of the nicest people I've ever met. Okay, man, I'm glad to Alex hear that. Is a great but those guys are family, though. They're on the road. I mean, it's easy yeah. to be nice to you and nice to me, but when you've been pissed off at someone, oh, you know, and his bills, it's, it's like a divorce. Yeah. You know, no one would treat that person that they fell in love with that way at the end. Right. But, um, God, they are, they're dysfunctional as fuck. Yeah, they are. I, you know, it's, it's funny. I'm reading the, the Van Halen biography right now and I'm in the really, really early days. I'm, I'm at the point before Dave even, even joined the band and early on, like Van Halen, you know, Alex Van Halen, Eddie Van Halen, they were known for being like the musicians, musicians. Right. Didn't move on stage at all. Eddie just absolutely was frozen solid, would not move. Too busy. Play. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, he could play. At work to do. He could play Albert yeah. Yeah, like nobody business or whatever. He could just like just play Clapton or whatever and just improvise and just be phenomenal, but he was just frozen. Right. And then here comes Dave. Yeah. It's some flamboyant, whatever, you know. Karate kicking. Yeah. Karate kicking. Door. Luckily, he was moving enough for everybody. Samurai right. guy. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens next. I haven't read yeah. that. But. Isn't it amazing how most really big bands disperse you know you know what i mean like yeah. throughout their careers they have these really big careers in the tribe called quest um mm-hmm. one of the five biggest hip hop yeah. yeah but five you was gone think, it's a yeah, he's no. already been he's died third like a week ago or something no yeah. Yeah. uh uh-uh. yeah oh man 
Yeah. But yeah. you would think, I mean, from the outside, you always think, what do they have to fight about? He had diabetes. They're on top of the world. Oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah. 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 They, he called himself the funky diabetic. Funky yeah. diabetic, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the, the, like the police, for example, you know, the police mm-hmm. broke up in, in yeah. early on. Mm-hmm. They, these massive careers what know. the With Beatles and they, and they <laughs> yeah right yeah. Yeah. let's just start there yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. what the fuck yeah. happened yeah. there we have yeah. the best thing let's ever of all time the fuck all you all ever happened to anybody. anybody yeah well you know it's like there's Metallica no, yeah well Metallica's They're not broken up Oh, okay. I was watching those. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching some documentary, and they were they were. Oh uh, man, I didn't know we just love the band name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the 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 funny thing is, band. If you're really, if you're that kind of band, if you're the police, if you're Metallica, mm-hmm. or if you're whoever, there's no need to break up. Honestly, there is no. What disagreement? It is if you're writing the songs, you're getting all the money. Mm-hmm. And I'm, well, that's okay. You know I mean? but that's true. Yeah. That's what happens. That's true. Uh, but there's. I, there was this thing with um, like when Kiss got back together mm-hmm. and they did the original four members and they did a tour and it right. didn't go well you yeah. know, as you'd imagine mm-hmm. well, same old well, ticket sales or was, attitudes eh. which is why you didn't see that Eagles yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm gonna check that out that. well the, the the thing about the, the thing about the Kiss thing was Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons from Kiss mm-hmm. dedicated their lives to that band right you know Peter Chris quit Ace Frehley quit at different points. Mm-hmm. And then when they were going to get back together, I think that Peter Chris and Ace Frehley thought, well, it's going to be a four way split. You know, yeah. we're going to split everything four ways. Not anymore, it's not. You know, that doesn't happen with Gene Simmons. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't happen in the Eagles. And Gene, yeah. Nope. You're right. Yeah. And if you're in a band with a guy named Chaim, <laughs> he's not taking no. a even split. No, no he's not. You know what? And I have a lot of respect for Gene Simmons. NWA. His whole, he's, he's a businessman. He's man. a businessman. And yeah. his whole argument was, was like, look, Paul Stanley and I, we made this our lives. We didn't quit. So you know, this is this is our band. Mm-hmm. We're going to do this. You're going to make more. You're going to. I think they that Peter Chris and Ace Frehley were given a million dollar salary mm-hmm. to do the tour, mm-hmm. and which is you know, nothing for a Kiss tour. It's nothing for a Kiss tour. And Gene Simmons <laughs> and Paul Stanley, I'm sure, made copious amounts more sure. than that. But um, it's like one. But you know, they were like the their position was. It was like, look, <laughs> this is yeah. but this is all we've done. This mm-hmm. is our life here. That we done, and I understand. I get that. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing about the thing about the Eagles, though. Mm. On the other hand, I'll say this on the other hand. Yeah. Because like Don Felder is a great guitar player. Sure. He wrote Hotel California. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, these guys wrote. Randy Meisner wrote Ticket to the Limit. Yeah. Oh, he, Randy, maybe he wasn't invited back for the tour, but they all had hands in the writing of this stuff. And so when Don Henley and Glenn Fry kind of came in and did the same thing about we're going to put you guys on salary and we are the two co-CEOs of this company yeah. called mm-hmm. the Eagles. And, well, you, you can argue whether or not that was right or not. Yeah, not everybody's going to take that the same way. Right. You know, it's a negotiating point. Yeah. Some people are going to go, I don't agree with it. I'm not doing it. And other people are going to go, well, you know what, then you get to worry about all the bullshit. I'm going to show up. I'm going to have my dressing room the way I like my dressing room. I'm going to play the gig. I'm going to go home. I'm good yeah. with that. The problem that Randy Meisner had, he's not Don he's Henley. Not, he was not as good. And any song that Don Henley wants to sing, that's his fucking song. Well, Don Henley yeah. is is one of the has one of the best voices of ever. I know, he's in that band. You promise you're in that band. Like you'd yeah. be a great guy in any other band. It's like being Jermaine Jackson. Yeah. Jermaine yeah. Jackson <laughs> is the baddest dude in any room. Yes. Except for the room that Michael's in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, any one of the Jackson Five would have been the best dude in yeah. any. You stick fucking Marlon in the gap band, and he's running everything. <laughs> oh, wow, that's a funny freaking hell. You're right, though. You're right. I mean, look at Joe Walsh, right? Joe Walsh can run his own band. Oh, yeah. And he's like, and no, he I, does, and it's, it's great. Like, yeah. But he's in like, the Eagles. In the Eagles, I'm, I'm Joe Walsh the from the Eagles. Right. You know? like, yeah, I hope you guys will take me back. Yeah. Glenn yeah. Fry, like, the next guy, you got Glenn Fry and Don Henley. You're not going to be better than either one of those guys. They're just... And they did have a really, really strong point when they came back. They said, look, we have been sticking this out. Yes. You know, you guys quieted down and all that stuff, but all all the momentum we have right now is based on... Us, yeah. yeah. So guess what? We're the show now. We've still been selling the album. You got him out of your seat, in line, yeah. or we can go yeah. hire Timothy. You should have stayed in your mm-hmm. seat. Right. Timothy yeah. B. Schmidt's yeah. like, I'll take that job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, Poco ain't doing shit. Yeah. I'm not going <laughs> with you guys. But, yeah, but it's yeah, you're right. I mean, it's true. But it, when the Eagles got back together in '94, 
I think Don Felder especially kind of thought it was going to be like, we're going to be a band and five guys mm-hmm. and everything's going to be split evenly and and that didn't last very long. Yeah. And, you know, and so there was a lot of, there was a lot of bad blood there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the guy still, he came up with a riff that was the basis for Hotel California, which is one of the most classic rock songs ever. Ever, yeah. And so I don't, yeah, obviously I'm not, don't have any information about you know not privy to how they split things up i just i would just hope that that they would compensate those guys that, that contributed that yeah you know i mean that t- with timothy B. schmidt um i can't tell you why was the eagles first number one hit wow yeah. that's right and so that's right. Mm-hmm. you know they um so i would i would like to think that they would take that into consideration when they were giving out everyone's salaries you know? yeah but okay yeah I mean, anyway, that's my story. But, but you could pitch that if you were in that position. You would go, okay, all right. I get that you guys are running the show now. So uh, how about we let you run the show, but here's what I'd like my salary to be, and here's why I think that's fair. You negotiate. Mm-hmm. And, well, you know, I did, I did like I mentioned this with the Eagles tribute band in the long run. Yeah. I, the, the way I kind of, it's weird the way that I kind of contacted them, but the bass player, Jim, is a great guy. They're all really great guys. I was invited to play a show with them in Chicago and St. Louis. To a couple of shows uh-huh. um, about a year ago, and right off the bat, they told me, they said, we split everything five ways. Mm-hmm. Everybody's, everybody's makes whatever we make as a pool, once expenses are paid, split five ways. Everybody made. They didn't even know me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, why can't the Eagles see this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. a, lot more, a lot more money on the line. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. Because you get to the point, you know this being on tour, you get to the point where you feel like, dude, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, you go back to your hotel room. Yeah. I'm still here doing, mm-hmm. fuck yeah. that. That's I deserve. Brand. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, you just, I'm producing. Yeah. What are you doing? You just come in and play in right. the show. All yeah. you do is sound check in the show. Yeah. I'm still here till 12 o'clock. Well, yeah. that was one of the things with Van Halen, too, because Van Halen, early on in their career, and Eddie has mentioned this, that it was a stupid thing on his part, is they split everything four ways. And mm-hmm. they did with the original band. I don't know how things have been changed now. We negotiated. Sure. And he was like, I'm writing everything. And I'm I'm still making the same amount as somebody who's not writing. Anything. Mike. That's exactly yeah. what happens. You get yeah. these million platinum hits, and you're like, I'm splitting these with these guys. It doesn't you even. I mean? But you. But I don't think it has to be million platinum hits because yeah. you could be making four hundred bucks a night. I mean, do the stakes make the difference, or are you sitting there going, man, we're only making four hundred bucks a night, and I'm giving you a hundred bucks, and I'm taking a hundred bucks, and I've written everything. I think so. At some point, it's all going to get on your nerves. I think so. I I think it's just over time. And if you're lucky, over time, the pool grows. But even if the pool doesn't grow, at some point, you're going to be like, fuck this guy, man. He leaves. Where are you going? I have to pack up your amp, too? Yeah. And then you got to deal with with people in your ear. That's Mm -hmm. what happened to War, actually. Because when War Mm -hmm. was a starving young band, Mm -hmm. they would go to this burger joint in Long Beach, and they would split... Three burgers, seven ways. Wow. They figured out how to, okay. What well, War was getting, this. they were getting ripped by the management, who's the same manager that managed Sly. Yeah. Wow. Um, Jerry, uh, not to mention any names, but right. everybody that he managed was getting ripped off. Wow. Everybody was. Mm-hmm. So a lot of that, that was is. That thing back then. Matter of fact, it's still, well, still a thing. Yeah. It's still a thing. <laughs> NWA. NWA. <laughs> Easy E was like, oh, hold on, I'm a band. And. Ice Cube was writing all the hit songs. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We gotta talk about that right now. <laughs> oh yeah, because <laughs> I've been like obsessed. Like the last, just this week, I've been watching all these documentaries with Vlad TV. Mm. This dude interviews like all those rappers and whatever. Mm. And he was interviewing Easy E son, and he was talking about. He started off by saying, "I interviewed you. I don't know, seven years ago, whatever, back." you know, in Easy es old home, and you were still there. I noticed the entire time you were standing there looking over your shoulder the whole time we were interviewing. You're freaking Easy es son, you know? And he made a point. He said, my dad was worth $50 million when he died. He was 11 years old, right? Mm-hmm. In the movie, they make it look like Easy took this and took that mm-hmm. and, you know, signed over. He owned this. He owned the publishing, blah, blah, blah. Right. He's like, my dad put up everything. Yeah. yeah, right. He did. He, yeah, he, was, he was the money man. Doesn't the executive yeah. producer no. on anything you do end up with the most of everything? Mm-hmm. So why right, shouldn't right. he get? So he had, I was like, oh, I never quite thought about it like it's, that. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting. It sucks, but it's legitimate. And that's part of the price to get in at that level because mm-hmm. 
Jerry's right. Those guys aren't going to, they're going to walk into any place and you sell shit. And when they do, they're going to get the same shitty deal. You still should have the perspicacity to let everybody know what this is what Correct. I'm getting and this is what you're getting. Correct. Be, be, if you do that at the front, you're not going to have a, if you do that at takeoff, Keep you're going to have a great Keep land. Yeah. But when you're, but when you're getting that opportunity, when some guy's like, I can break this band, let's keep this simple. Let's get this done. Let's get you, let's go make some money and then we'll figure it out. Like, I can see that that's, being the case. That's, you're trying that's to get suicide there. because you're going on the road but, thinking. But oh, we know that now. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, you mm-hmm. can see that in reference. When they're saying, hey, go to Japan. You guys are like, fuck yeah, let's go to Japan. Let's go. You know? Yeah. And the guy's like, here's money. And you're like, all right, cool. And the next thing I'm you know. I'm a kaijin and I like Japanese pussy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Paul McC- <laughs> think about it this way. Paul McCartney's still trying to get his songs back. You know? <laughs> this is why. Hey, Paul McCartney, they, they, they didn't the own the publishing. Did I know, that's it. I mean, the the look. That's, 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 that's the, the business of it. Yeah. That's the business. That's and it sucks. It you sucks. Know, right, I had to go through that. There's a, but that's the business. There's a great book out there that I read that really made, just open my eyes to the way the music business works. By a guy named Moses Avalon, and it's called Confessions of a Record Producer. Oh, I heard about mm. that book. You, yeah. Absolutely, it's it's a must read if you're in the music business, mm. and it'll make you not want to be in the music. Business. <laughs> yeah, I know. and I mean it, 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 the late, latest version talks about like 360 deals and that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, mm. now, but he, he takes there's a point where he talks about the perspective of the music business from an artist, from a record label, and from a producer. Oh wow! Mm. And so it's like so as an artist, you go in mm-hmm. and here's you, what you believe. This is what you believe, mm-hmm. and this is what the reality is. Yeah, and for record label. And, you know, the record label is making an investment. Right. Yeah. And Here's so, what you need to be true if you're the yeah. record label. Yeah. And so then this and is what you've got this, this dreamer over do. here doing these things. Yeah. You're like rope him and in. So we're going to, yeah. And, and, and then from the producer's aspect, your producer that brings in an ad mm-hmm. or brings in an artist to the label. And then the label says, all right, we're going to have you produce this band and, you know, record the music, help them write the music, whatever they need to do. You're going to make the product. In that um, trifecta there, the producer has the best deal. Because the producer really, they're not putting up the money, right. and you know, if a band, if, if you're, they get the better back end participation. Yes, and if you're a band, it's kind of like you know, if, if you come in, you're four guys, and you're like, all right, we got signed, we're going to make an album, and it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that could be your only shot, mm-hmm. or you might be lucky to get another one or a right. couple more. But that's like this, you're that's mm-hmm. your dream, and so you're rolling the dice on your freaking dream. Producer is like. I got another artist I'm working with in six weeks. Right, if this shitty right. band doesn't do it, mm-hmm. hey guys, get yes. money in, you know. And so, and from from a production standpoint, I looked at mm. that going, you're going to be in the music business. Don't be an artist. Don't be a record label. You can be a producer. Yeah, because you know? they're the ones that are really able to make a career, and that's yeah. really what it comes down to. If you're if you're in that's this it. business because you want to get rich. You go ain't going to get rich. No, it's yeah. not going it, to. Go it's, back to it's, call, again, it's, it's not never gonna, the gold miner that gets the money. You know, right. It's the guy that sells <laughs> the, the jeans. Yeah. You know, right, the yeah, boots. Yeah. The right. buttons. The guy that sells the shovels. buttons. Yeah. yeah, I got shovels. <laughs> yeah. You know, this a guy. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete Turner. And if you like the show. Do us a favor. Yeah, share it. That's the biggest thing, honestly. All your social media outlets, all your friends, let them know the ones that you like. I mean, we make this show for you guys. If you think it's great, say so. Say so by sharing it. Say so by putting a comment in after the show. Also, if you go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts, give us a rating. Give us a review. If you think the show is great, please give us five stars and say so. And if you think the show really sucks, please give us five stars and say so. Because, <laughs> heck, we're listening that's right. You can't be more approachable than us. We, we want to make the show better. If there's something that we're missing, let us know. Yeah, that really is how you help us. That's right. Tell us all about it. Thanks for listening. And now back to the show. Because you guys are good friend. It was an old friend of mine, a guy named Butch Walker. I don't know if you ever heard of Butch Walker. Yeah. He's a producer. I heard that name. And he, um, he was in a band. We, I was actually, the Cry Wolf was, was, was playing the country club. And... We were flyering the night before, and this tall, lanky, long-haired kid comes up to me and introduces himself, and he said he was a fan of Cry Wolf. And so this guy's name is Butch. And so we ended up talking and exchanged numbers and everything, and it was funny because we spent so much time talking on the phone about like music and life and everything, and my roommates were sat me down and they're like, uh, who's this Butch guy? Because you're spending a lot of time talking yeah, about Yeah, right. Oh. It's I'm like, man no, 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 he's just like, he just <laughs> <laughs> like, But, and so he, um, so anyway, so Butch was in a band at the time they were called um, something I'm totally forgetting now but uh, they changed their name to South Gang 
and they ended up getting a record deal mm. with, and they, they toured, they put two albums out. They did well. They were on MTV and everything. And so as it happens, the hair metal thing ended. They're from Georgia originally, moved back to Atlanta <clears throat> and um, band broke up or the singer left. And so Butch continued on and they changed the name to Floyd's Funk Revival, which he said was kind of a mistake because they started getting these like shows for like funk. Mm-hmm. So right. here they were a rock band uh-huh. and so they'd show up and there'd be a bunch yeah. of lowriders yeah. 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 <laughs> so, we can play so raw nobody's yelling free bird yeah. 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 they can play raw and they and so then they changed the name to Marvelous 3 ended up getting another record deal and ended up getting like a minor hit hmm. for, for it back in like the early 90s mm-hmm. and so Marvelous Three record was a really was a great record, produced production wise, and so he was approached. Butch was approached by somebody. He's like, "Who produced this record? Because we really we like the way that it sounds." And his response was, "Well, I did it. I guess it was me. I, it was me. I did it because we had no money. I had no choice but to try to put this thing together." And whoever I don't know who the label was, I may have been A and M. Said, "Well, we have a new artist we're trying to work with and trying to get her a record made. Would you be willing to produce her?" Was Ava Levine. Oh, so he co-wrote and produced Avril Lavigne's first record wow. and then he started working with a lot of bands from that era mm-hmm. producing their records mm-hmm. then became a hotshot producer mm-hmm. and so now he's still doing he's still producing he produces Pink he produced Tommy Lee's record mm-hmm. and um, he still has his solo career he still has his production career mm-hmm. and he's still writing songs for people that are that are hit songs. Mm-hmm. In fact, he was just on talking about American Idol. Mm-hmm. Um, he was on he produced Harry Connick Jr.'s latest record. Mm-hmm. And Harry Connick Jr., I guess, in one of the last shows, performed whatever new song it was, and Butch played with him mm-hmm. on the show. Mm-hmm. And here's a guy I'm like, this is this is the kid that was a long kid. Yeah. yeah. And he just refused to give up. Yeah, he's got a lot bigger balls than I. That is the common thread Mm. for everybody that you know. They just fucking wouldn't go away. And you said it like he had a lot bigger balls than I do, and that, (laughs) and and that's not a knock. No, no, no. That's just a fact. I I admit it. I mean, you know, but again, I was like, in retrospect, I was like, I got, I got to get a job. There is, I can't see big balls right in front of me. I can't see them until later. Later, I can see. He's him. never actually let me Excuse see me that. <laughs> he was he was drunk, and I was too. And I'm like, hey, Chad, I, I was too. Pretty good time. Yeah, I was too. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even necessarily about ball. It's about choices, you know. Like yeah. at some point. Someone, yeah, I got this girl. I can't be on the road anymore. I'm going to give this a shot. You know, you yeah. make a choice on uh, this. Price. Yeah. Goddamn girls. Yeah. 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 Girls. Jeez, man. <laughs> you know, you balance things out. You're trying yeah, to, but it's all about what your heart is and what your yes. priorities are. If right. you, sure. And if there's nothing wrong with picking the girl. No. Or having the kid. Or there's the, nothing wrong with having the kid. But it's, it's what, if you're a woman, you're like, yeah. okay, I'm 28. Okay, I got maybe another 10 years before I got to put out a kid. Do yeah. I want a kid or do I want to do music? Um, Tina Davis. Yeah. I, I had a conversation with her. She said, I had a choice to make. Do I want to have a family or do I want to do music? Yeah. She said, I, I'm, I'm doing music. So right. it's, it's the same thing. If you, yeah. if, if you love it, then you do it because of the love and not because of the money. Yeah. Because especially in the music Brown industry, it's, it's, you're not gonna you're get rich. Not, not, not today. No, no, not today. No. Well, you know, it's. I just. I. You know, it's funny. It's. You're right. It's all. It's all whatever. You, whatever's in your heart. Right. I know people that I played in bands with that are are so focused on whatever I need to do to become famous mm-hmm. that that just drives me crazy. Right. You're missing. You're missing the point. Right. I think and they're like, still not famous. Right. No. Right. No, and you that reach just a point. Doesn't happen. You reach yeah. a point where you have to look back and say, "I don't think the world is looking for a new rock band of guys in their fifties, right? right. right. <laughs> <laughs> or, or rappers in their forties starting exactly. out." Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's not. I mean, look, if you want to play and you, and that's where your heart is, and then do it, and then do it, but don't do it for because you think, "Oh, this is a vehicle for my." For me getting famous, it's or the wrong rich precious. or whatever, and it's like that's everybody's got to work. Richard Cheese makes money. Yeah. He's got to work, and every every night that guy's out doing this gig. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, <laughs> that's Pete's example. Richard Cheese. Well, and you know, true, who picks that career? Yeah, I and mean, I'm not, nothing wrong with Richard Cheese. I'm, I love what he does. But well, and who, hopefully who gets he into, does too. Yeah, and on and clearly he does too. And but. on the, the the opposite end, I'll mm-hmm. take some say somebody like Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, 
who's pushing 70 years old, right. still goes out and does three-hour concerts, yeah. running. and just sings his ass yeah. out, running Man. around. He doesn't have to do that anymore. No. Man. He does it because it's in it's Man. Three, it was 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. I was doing a rehearsal. George Clinton... Sly Stone. Oh, man. It was George's turn to get up. It was damn near 5 a.m. George, it's your turn to get up. He gets up and he starts singing like he's in front of a... Uh, I mean, he's shaking his head around and he's bobbing and I'm... I'm in shock. I, I thought he was just going to like sit down like some people. He's just, George Clinton. He could that's, just walk he, up no, there. Exactly. He wanted to. It's he because could. he's George Clinton. Yeah. George Clinton is in a different, I mean, he's George Clinton. Yeah. I never <laughs> witnessed that kind of love of music until I, I saw yeah. that. That's their element. That's mm-hmm. when you feel the most comfortable. Man. You know I mean? Blew me away. Just, I'm, just. And, I'm and, not at all surprised. I was shocked no. because he didn't, because well, I've done, I've done, um, I did Lauren Hill. Mm-hmm. It is. It's different. You know what I mean. Walks in the rooms, like looks around. If the band is killing, okay, I'll get up there and I'll do a little something. Yeah. But someone, she doesn't have the the. Um, I mean, she sold probably no, she more records. Just came back. Uh, yeah, okay, well, she was gone for ten years. She was gone for a long. Time. She wasn't, but she wasn't gone for ten years. She was gone for six years. Whatever. You know what I mean? But, but, the fact, but that's the thing is that the four years <laughs> that we think, oh, she's gone ten years. No, she was around. She yeah. just didn't. Well, kick that it into gear. Now, if you talk to her and you talk to Chappelle, same mm-hmm. kind of, okay. same kind of from what from my personal conversation. Similar. I see. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying. But what I'm talking about is and okay. She's entitled to that. Yeah. Her, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever, whatever your reason is. Yeah. But I'm I'm comparing her love of of like hey, we're about to rehearse to George Clinton, who's who's, who's probably if not seventy. Yeah, yeah. right know, there. Yeah, singing. Yeah, and, you know, it's still singing right. the same songs mm-hmm. too. Yeah, you know, like coming over. Do y'all know we want the front of the? It's just something interesting. Let me just bring you. You were talking about Gene Simmons. Uh-huh. I don't know if you guys saw the interview he did with Dan Rather, mm. but Dan Rather asked him. So you guys were playing for forty years, no new songs. <laughs> <laughs> he asked him straight up, and Gene, fucking God bless him, he said, "You know, I realized a long time ago we're the type of band this set fucking works." Yeah, uh, yeah. We're not the type of band mm. that goes out and makes new albums. That's ACDC. We do it every too. 10 years. We might make a song or something. You know what I mean? It is ACDC. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Rolling Stones. This, yeah. this yeah. tour works. Mm-hmm. It sells out. We're the biggest band ever in the world. We have more than, you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the, the words that tour. everybody hates. Hey, here's one from our new album. Yeah. Oh, my like, God. Oh, that, yeah. that, okay. Yeah. We I don't want to hear it. We want to compete. Aerosmith, <laughs> Aerosmith went. I, I heard this thing a couple years ago. Aerosmith went in to record a new album. They uh-huh. go. They booked a time. They went to the studio. They're writing songs. And like Steven Tyler was like, why are we doing this? No one wants to hear these new songs. If we go out and tour after this, that means we're going to have to take Dream On or Back in the Saddle out of Something's the set. Something's got to come out. That's what people want to hear. What, you're, so what everybody's good. saying is that you become typecasted. Now, is that a bad thing? Does everybody only want to see Clint Eastwood in what westerns? No, but... But That's when you crazy. go to a concert, when you go to you a concert, you want to hear certain songs. No yeah. matter who the band is, you want to hear the hits. Yeah. You don't want to hear the, the obscure. So it's okay yeah. to be typecast. At a, it, you get to a point where you have a body of work. Right. You, right. Right. you get to, yeah. you get you to a point a, where you have a body of work. Yeah, but right. And your fan base gets to a point. This is what I will say: is that my desire to hear. Uh, New songs by Prince. Okay, I was just there about was to a bring point that up. in my life where Prince would put out a new album and I would go get it the morning it came out, right? And it would be in my tape decks, CD mm-hmm. player, mm-hmm. whatever year it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> hey, Jack. <laughs> for the next, for the next, <laughs> Big Trolla. <laughs> you don't have an old seventy-eight on the Big Trolla. <laughs> On the hood of my Packer. Yeah. Pat Kennedy was a real looker. Yeah, it's <laughs> what you say, Pat Kennedy. You go way back, man. So no, you're right. But at some point, your your ability to digest new music, if you're a listener, you go, I don't need new music. You know, yeah. I need these songs because I love these yeah. songs because I attach them to memories. Yeah. If I'm Brenna, mm. I've still got 10 years of creating memories mm. against new songs that come out. But, and then but I how can a group point. like you too, as an example, keep making new music and you keep buying, they keep touring, they keep... Yeah, Why know? can some people do it and some people can't? 
That, oh, that, that, is that what you're saying? That, you know, that, that's, that's an question. excellent. That's a yeah. great. That's a great point. Right. Let's let Pete yeah. answer it because he's the U2 expert in the room. All right, let's go. Why, Pete? Because Bono called me the other day. So, so go ahead and tell me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll tell you. First off, Edge keeps finding new, new, new blue water. He keeps mm-hmm. finding new textures, and he doesn't. It's not just a guitar for him. He's got a whole. He's got a room five scene. So is he, yeah. is he the main producer in that group? Well, he comes up with the feel, the texture, okay. right? Mm-hmm. And then Bono can find the character to sing from. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have to sing from himself. He mm-hmm. can, he does. Mm-hmm. And they have great music from that. Sure. Doesn't have to sing about a political issue. Mm-hmm. He can sing about you. Mm-hmm. And he can draw you out. Mm-hmm. And uh, because of that, they're able to find new territory to get into. And they're not, and they're not afraid. The other thing they're not That's afraid of. That's important. Is, uh, they'll take their time putting an album out. Mm-hmm. They, they won't rush it. Mm-hmm. And they have a great, you know, they have great people around them, but we're not going to put out something that's good. We're only putting out things that are great. Mm-hmm. And we'll eat 500 songs, mm-hmm. spend a lot of money producing them and throw them away because mm-hmm. the songs that come out are okay. great. Okay. You just went into something. I know, I know we're going long. There you we just go. Went, you just went into something really interesting. So I just got into a long conversation with me and a whole bunch of, we were in the writer's room here the other day. We were mm-hmm. talking with all these comedians, right? When we were talking about Tupac. And they were like, Hill, your guest from the Screenwriters Ram Room. You know how we do it. <laughs> we were talking about is Tupac dead? Is Biggie dead? Is somebody, it was like a whole bunch of people. Uh-huh. And somebody's like, okay, how in the hell are you going to come out with all these new songs all the time? Right? Every three years is new fucking Pac album, right? Boom, mm-hmm. boom, boom. Well, and I said, just what you said. Yeah. yeah. They'd be recording right. 500 fucking songs. Yeah. You know, you'd be in the studio. Mm-hmm. Right. You guys keep recording. Yeah. Some right. of them are demos. Some of them are half done. Some of them are whatever. And somebody, some producer comes in when you die. Yeah. Right? And goes, and you they, know what? I can finish this. Sugar exactly. Knight needs money. Yeah. That's, exactly. that's why Michael was able to put out more oh. records. But yeah. he'd be that's rolling over in his grave if he heard exactly. this last Because he didn't want that stuff yeah. out. Yeah. No, it's like all this stuff. Like, like, we found a new Jimmy. No, please don't put any more Jimi Hendrix out. Uh-huh. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because a friend of mine, my friend, singer Tim from Cry Wolf. Actually, years ago, met Eddie Van Halen. Went to his house, mm-hmm. and Ed was is playing piano. He's doing this thing, and he pointed up, and he he said to Tim, he pointed at the wall, was just full of two inch tapes, mm-hmm. like like twenty foot wide, right. ten foot high, just two inch tapes of all these recordings that he's done and never released, just wow. stuff that he's recorded. And he said to Tim, he said, "See that over there? It's like when I die, they're gonna have a hundred years worth of music to sell it out." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, wow. mm-hmm. you know, if if I guess if you sign off on it. And I don't know if John Lennon signed off on Free as a Bird when the Beatles re-released it, you know, 20-something years ago mm-hmm. after his death. I don't know if he would have wanted that out. But, I mean, if there's music there, there's money to be made from it, yeah. likely it's going to be put out. Can yeah. I ask you a question? Where would you like to see music go in yeah. the industry? Well, oh, man, I don't know. It is so tough right now. I read an article this morning about the number one album by Billboard magazine this week is, I think it's, it's Rihanna's. It's Rihanna's. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Work, work, work. Um, no, it's a, a anti. Yeah. So it sold this week seventeen thousand records. Yep, that's the, the number one, one record. Yes, the most number selling one. number one selling album <laughs> in the you get dropped for that. Yes, you yes. would. That, that wouldn't even be a question. Yeah. That was her release. That was that was that. Well, it's been no, out it's, for a couple of weeks. It's, okay. it's the second but, time at number one, but not in consecutive. But so seventeen thousand records. So, so I don't know where I don't know where I'd like to see it go. I think I see where it's going though. And it's what just do you think? My theory is that there was a there was a band that I really liked, a fairly new band called Satellite that mm-hmm. came out a few years ago, and the band's already over. Mm-hmm. And the singer, his he's recently I saw on, on Facebook he signed a deal with Disney as a writer. He's a songwriter. He's a great songwriter. <laughs> And that's what he was doing originally. He was a songwriter, put this band together, and then he went back to songwriting, signed a deal with Disney, and my this is where I think it's going to go, is that bands, labels like Disney are going to sign writers, and people are going to be writing contemporary mm. pop music. Disney's going to approach a, an artist, or will be approached by an artist like a young girl that can sing, who's really good looking, <clears throat> and say, these are the songs that you're going to sing. And and if she's like, well, no, I'm an artist. I don't do that. Well, there's a line of people behind mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And so then that is where the it's going to be. Everyone's going to be on salary. Who's right? going to get this salary. meal? And then, but then I started thinking about it. I'm like, this is the Motown model. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's exactly what it was back then. You had the Funk Brothers. You had this rhythm well, section. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so it's basically the same. It's a, it's the well, same model that was around well, in the 60s. What are your thoughts on uh, streaming and, and what they're paying the, the writers? I think it's awful. Um, you know, there was a. I, I saw a thing with with Bette Midler. I don't know if you saw that thing that she posted mm. six months or so ago. Mm-hmm. Bette Midler, 
I think it was Spotify and Pandora. She yeah. she actually made a copy of her statement and posted it online. She had I think one point like one point four million plays of her music, and she received a royalty check for seventeen hundred dollars. Wow! And yeah. she's no, like, that's about right. And she and and she's like, you can't make a living at this. No, you, know? you can't. New. I got a statement. One play. One spin. Point zero zero. Jesus. One. What? Yeah. Yeah, well, they say that, what is it, it was like um, on Spotify, because when you t- talk, you factor in like record sales and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. 1,500 plays of a song is considered to be one One sale. unit moved. Yeah. One unit mm-hmm. moved. Wow. And so, I don't so, know yeah. uh, if they're making a lot of money. Okay. I don't know. Advertising. Yeah. Ten, it's $10 a month to have Pandora so or So, what Spotify. they've done is they've amassed all this content. Yes. By cheapening. The content creation, yeah. yeah, and putting it out there and making advertising dollars, and yeah. because we as consumers are willing to say, "Oh, I'll listen to music that's free," sure, I will. I'll grab a commercial every now and again, and it's no different than being on the radio. Except now we all have these devices, and we can call up the music that we like. Mm-hmm. Before, I had to listen to KFRC for <laughs> three, three days, days in, in a, a row, Rose program, yeah. just to hear, <laughs> three days you know, in a row. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> So yeah. now you, you don't have to be patient with it. You don't have to listen to all the ads. You can just say, oh, no, I'm going to call that up, and then I'm going to let that go, and I'm going to listen to three or four songs in one commercial, and then I'm mm-hmm. going to go somewhere yeah. else do something else. So <clears throat> it sucks to be a content creator. But anytime there's an ecosystem and one part of the ecosystem <clears throat> is getting robbed, the ecosystem will melt. Yeah. So but it will I mean other, it's I I'm, I'm meeting people who are starting websites that were saying okay we can we'll start a website that will compete with Pandora sure. and we'll pay our writers their fair share. Yeah. But whether they can compete with Pandora and Spotify mm-hmm. it remains to be seen. Well, if the top acts I mean Taylor Swift pulled her stuff off she yeah. didn't want, you know. But she can afford to do well, that. Yeah, but I mean she leads the way. And the other thing is is there's been other ways to make music. So, you know, like back in the in the classic era. Mm-hmm. You belonged to that Duke or that Earl, and that guy paid you. And you mm. just so that's going to happen. People are going to work for a benefactor that and be exploited. Yeah, it, it, I'm, what they always have been, like yeah, they always will be. Right. But that person will say, "Listen, I'm going to give you a very good living. You can make all the music you want, but it belongs to Apple, you know, and it's going to be our catalog was, of music. Was, yeah. You're going to get paid, but this is what it's going to be. And other people are going to do like more of the Mozart thing. We're like, I'm just going to do my own private concerts. You're going to pay straight to me." You know, and, and which is where I think most of the people are going. Yeah, yeah. that's where all yeah, yeah staging. You know, everybody yeah. I know, you know the band is doing their own yeah. shit and selling them themselves and the, selling the merch. And right. The trick is to being being able to to kind of sift through that minutia of all these bands that are doing it and find people that you like. You know, but I was thinking about when you talk about Prince, the uh, Dave Saker again, mm-hmm. but he was this this you know Dave, I don't know. Mm-hmm. This guy's a guitar player. is like a, le- a Vallejo legend, and um, he really and, is. Yeah, mm-hmm. and just and he in deserves his, every yeah, bit of it. Yeah, he does. Um, he was telling me a story years ago that he was recording for these guys, recording guitar tracks in the record plant in um, Sausalito. And he was, Dave was there and he had his headphones on or whatever. He had his guitar and he was recording his guitar track. And he said he felt something and he stopped. He was like, he turned around and there was this guy standing there. Middle of the night. Mm-hmm. Middle of the night. This guy standing there. Real quiet guy comes walking up to him. And he's like, hey. And then they were talking for a few minutes. A little bitty motherfucker, too. Yeah. <laughs> Not high heels yeah. <laughs> Talking. They were talking for a few minutes. And then, you know, he said he was really nice guy, kind of quiet and shy or whatever. And he walked off. He talked about it. He said, Dave, he's like, he liked his playing or whatever. Mm-hmm. The guy walked off. And they were like, that's weird. He's like, I felt the guy behind me. It was Prince mm-hmm. when he was recording his, his first album in the record plant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they and put him heard up. Of him. And he lived at the record plant for yeah. like two weeks. Yeah. He was the and so... Where are those people going to come from? Yeah, you know, yeah. where are the prince who's the princes, who's one of the the most talented. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. in a in a handful of musicians in history, right? Rock musicians or, or contemporary musicians in history, like he's got to be in the top five. Like he, Paul McCartney, mm-hmm. as far as just being able to be such a just musical a of badass. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of, and you know, who's are those people going to become attorneys? Right. You know, are they going to look at the music business and go, there's nothing unhappy to old yeah. well, it, it has to find its it has to find its life. That's it's, what I'm saying. You have to look at the um but Donald the, Trump and the and the and the and the um real estate. Mm-hmm. When all his friends were bouncing, he was like, I, I like real estate. I think I'm a, I got to stay. I think it has to find its life. I love music. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, this is how I eat. This is how I make my living. And my feelers are out trying to trying to find, you know, paying my rent and doing everything that I'm doing to survive mm-hmm. yeah. because I love music. First and foremost, fame, don't care about it. Making and writing the next song or, or, or scoring the next film or whatever. Whatever I can do as far as art, it has to find its light. And I think that's the beauty of it. Because if you look at what art form in the history of the planet has completely died off, we still have classical music. Mm-hmm. We still have symphonies. Every major city has a symphony orchestra. Sure. Classical music is not dead. It's, it's so the art music. form will refuse to die. I okay, that's you. that's what I'm trying to say. But the, what, what I'm saying is the ecosystem that exists now and that continues to evolve toward, let's say, Pandora. I don't mean make Pandora the bad guy or Spotify, but they're the bad guy. If they're not paying <laughs> their artists, eventually there's an ecosystem with a with a component that is fizzling. Mm-hmm. And that ecosystem, that whole ecosystem, because that one failure is happening, is going to melt. Something will replace it. Somebody okay. will say, oh, now I know what. And just like bands now have said, I can't, there's no way for me to sell 10 million records anymore. Mm-hmm. I can't make that living that way. Okay, what but are you going to do? Well, sell 10000 a year and multiply that times 10 or $20. And... Mm-hmm. And what I'm going to do is go out and play live because mm. what has happened in our lifetime that we can see is we used to go see Day on the Green for five bucks. Yeah, sure. And mm. we'd go there and we'd see some band saying, "Hey, here's an, our new record, and you we're gonna you're gonna love this song, and you'd love it." And then you mm. go, "Man, I'd love to hear that song again. I'm gonna go buy the record from mm. Tower. I'm gonna go right. Tower Records and Concord. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you go buy a record from Bobby Lee, mm-hmm. and you would." Enjoy that record. Well, now that record is free. Yeah. And now you listen to the record and you go, holy shit, I bet you those guys are awesome live. I really, and then they yeah. come to town and they go, hey, if you really like our record, come see us live. Come spend some money with yeah. us. And you go, and now you drop a 100 bucks to see a show. Mm. And then you get there and you go, these guys are so amazing. I absolutely want to support what they do. I'm buying the hoodie. Right. For seventy five dollars, right. or two hundred if you're Kanye, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So they can charge that. T-shirt. or three thousand if it's Kanye the shoes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this is why I think like the Apple and U two model. Well, granted, I don't know what the gap is from not being established to where U two is, but Apple can buy that album for a hundred million dollars or whatever they paid for it, and U two can go. We just made a hundred million dollars like that. Done. And then their back catalog sells like crazy. Mm-hmm. People, they sold a shitload of music on Apple. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's something to that model where that will work for some bands. No, yeah. it'll be the come see us play live for other, you know. There will be smart business people. Yes. They will find the, the gap. Business person yeah. Part. Yeah. But here, here's the question, though. Would the quality of the product be as good as it is now or as it was? Or is it going to be like music going to be like food where where – it's it like it McDonald's. McDonald's is easily accessible. Anybody mm-hmm. can get, you can pick it up on any corner, but it's shit. Mm-hmm. What well, well, quality in what way? Quality in the sound because we've we, we've come from the warmth of analog, which is beautiful, right. and now we're in digital. No, I mean the quality in the in the, in the quality of songwriting. Oh, okay, and the quality oh, well, of the people, the music that's being that. because I, we all know people that that. When you talk, when I, you know, as a musician and being really into music and artists and songwriters and that kind of thing, and you say, you talk to somebody, it's like, what kind of music do you like? And they're like, ah, oh, whatever's on the radio. Mm-hmm. I don't really like, yeah. I don't know what that guy's name is, but and I said, I'm just like, fuck. The, the answer me. to that is, is this, and I'll use Firehouse as an example. <laughs> Def Leppard's better. You know, it's just flat out fucking better. Well played. And Firehouse <laughs> might get a gig here and there, and they're going to make money. The guy that is 85% of David Lee Roth is going to go put on a fedora and he's going to go make some money. But Def Leppard's going to win. Yeah. Because they're just, they're better. Prince is going to win. He's and I'm going to say this to Phil and to Corey and to Hill because I think deep down you guys all know this to be true. The quality always fucking wins. Yeah. Always. <laughs> it's, it's always wins. Okay. We used to be, <laughs> have the warmth of analog. Fetty and then digital came along. And then you come and now my way. All this <laughs> digital music and everybody's got their iPod or their thousand songs on their phone. Mm-hmm. And now we're listening to things that aren't as warm and aren't as. Amazon sold more vinyl players last Christmas mm-hmm. yeah, than any other device to play music. Mm-hmm. More vinyl players. So that's going to come back because the quality will always win. 
it may take a long damn time. Or is it, it may be an to have a justice. It may be an injustice for how long it takes but to win, but the quality will always win. I don't know if it's about the quality. I wonder if it's about, like, our generation, we're all, you know, 40s, 50s, I'm assuming. So our generation, we bought certain yeah, right. records, right? <laughs> you all, too. We bought certain records, right? You, we like the thing about opening them up and looking and reading and uh-huh. seeing all the mm-hmm. sleeves. Yeah. Yeah. like sitting on the toilet. Just mm-hmm. now, oh, we yeah. picked up. Oh, yeah. like, I was in a record. I was in a beanbag chair. You did a double album. You're like, oh That's my right. god, it's right. a trip. We are the age now where we have kids. Uh-huh. Right? Not my ass. I got two dogs. But when we have kids, uh-huh. so we're the ones buying our kids' albums and shit, so to speak, right? So. That now that vinyl is back, uh-huh. we're the group who's buying them. I guarantee you, if you look at them, they're probably all guys who look like us. You know, you know unless yeah, you're DJ. Buying those. Now, I can't say, sure. but, but, but you know, gen- I'm generalizing. That. That's I'm generalizing. a laptop now in Serato. Yeah, yeah, I'm generalizing, but you know, I would assume that a big portion of those guys are people over forty. Let me ask. Let me ask the expert. The people with money. Pop music. No, I agree. You may be right. I agree. You, you, you may be right. Absolutely. You, you may be They're right there. They're not spending ninety nine cents. But here's the thing: when I was a, a little kid, I got lucky enough to figure out how to work my dad's record player mm-hmm. and the headphones. I would put the headphones in the tuner and work my dad's record player. And my mom and dad were like. Shit, he's being quiet. Let's go fucking kitchen. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's what I did. Yeah. But, Let's go I, I'm fucking in your kitchen. parents' kitchen. I would. <laughs> your dad's like this. <laughs> no, he's over there still. Why right. can't we capture that? Um, but, <laughs> what happened was that instead of listening to some bullshit, mm-hmm. I discovered Tower of Power. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I discovered Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm-hmm. But that was what was hot at the time. So let's ask Brenda though, because she's she's the person that's going to help redefine what happens. First off, it's what do you like better, older music from a different era, or do you like new music better? Do you think older music? That's Why? It. Yeah, there you go. It's better, and they talk about more real things rather mm. than now. It's mostly just pop and all that. Mm. Yeah. And where's music going? Right now, it's all poppy and all that. Nothing like great. Nothing you want to spend money on. Yeah. I, I want to go out of my way to like go on iTunes and buy one of those songs, I guess. Yeah. And it's the quality question of the songwriting. Because yeah. if modern pop is crap, or if, I don't want to say modern pop is crap, there are great pop songs that are out there. Mm-hmm. But if a lot of the stuff that's being produced, Forced and by produced, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, that if it's, if it's crap, then people are going to look towards things that are older. Mm-hmm. They're going to look towards things that are... Of a, maybe of a higher writing quality. When I when I talk about quality, I'm specifically talking about the quality of the song, mm-hmm. and the strength of the melody, and mm-hmm. the strength of the the rhythm, the string. string. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, because now any with pro, I have a Pro Tools system at home. Anybody can record an album yeah. at home. Yeah. Yeah. Garage band, whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, where it is now, it's either you either have to adapt or you're just gonna die. You just have to say, okay, I got to do more shows. So let me put up, let me let me do a system where I can do more shows. Maybe give my CD away and and then say and come check out come check out my band we're playing. Most people say you're a great you're a great keyboard player. Where where are you playing at? Oh, I'm playing here 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 and here. That's what people want to see because people will tell you they tell me all the time. Me I, I don't buy are we still going to concerts? People are at home a lot now. People or or you know watching their computers on their phones and shit. Are we still? Are you seeing from being on the show? Are you seeing, you guys go to a lot of shows? I mean, there's not a lot of people like you guys anymore. Because like I drive up on Sunset Boulevard on, on Saturday night, just driving through. Not like it was. No. It's not that crowded anymore. No. You well, know I'll, what I mean? I'll tell you. That's because Cry Wolf's not out there anymore. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'll tell you. It, it, it's there was there was a period of time for you, like the last bit of Cry Wolf before we broke up. Mm-hmm. The, we, there would be discussions within the band about the best way to promote the band, the best way to try to move up to the next step or whatever. And, and there was somebody in the band that was like, all we got to do is is just play shows and be a great live band. And then people will start coming to the shows and then we'll get a record deal. And we'll, because that's the way Van Halen did it. And I'd be I, like, dude, that, that's... No, that's so not the way. That's not the, I'm like, that's not 1970. I'm like, 1977 anymore, man. That's yeah. when, you know, I said when Van Halen was playing the clubs, their biggest... Competition was Quiet Riot and this band called Smile and that kind of thing. I said, our biggest competition is Netflix. Mm. Our biggest competition is, is YouTube. Yeah. You know, because anybody could stay home and get all the entertainment they want. Mm. You can watch 
a high definition live concert on channel 100 on Becomes. Direct TV or whatever. Becomes. But, you know, but do you know that we create the same amount of content every week? <laughs> every week. Can you do this every week? <laughs> really? As we've done between the dawn of time and 1974. We do? Yeah. Wait, two weeks. Oh, that's that's two weeks. humanity. Two, oh, two, two weeks. Two weeks. weeks. Every two weeks. Society creates as much content as we did between the dawn of time and 1974. You know what's funny? I thought you were talking about this room. <laughs> Honestly, we're busy. Yeah. I mean, this room just heals. Yeah, no, no. Heals output alone. Uh, yeah, but I mean, that's how much mm. stuff is out there. Yeah. That's how many things there are mm. to consume. John and I have the better part of 100 hours of content up on mm-hmm. the web, you know, wow. right now. Right. And, and that's just us, just doing what we do. Yeah. Joe Rogan has. A thousand hours? Oh, he's got thousands of he's hours. Been doing yeah. Man. Yes. Yeah. And I'm mm-hmm. coming up on 100 episodes of mine, too. Wow. wow. Mm-hmm. It's how you find that content. Because a lot of times, when you talk about, like, website, mm-hmm. I designed websites years ago, and somebody explained to me early on, it's like a website, you can make the greatest website in the world. You can be the best band in the world, or mm-hmm. be providing whatever the best content is, and it's like creating the most, the best store in the world mm-hmm. out in the middle of a desert. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How are you going to get people to it? Right. How are you going to let people know that it exists yeah. to even go to your yeah. website? You pay to Google to get you up on the on the top of the list. Yeah, yeah. The, they they sell. Uh, the, Google's that making money. Google's a rock star. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, that's a new rock star. Yeah, yeah Google's got like they on. They're not afraid. But I got into songwriting a few years ago, and I went into YouTube, and I was just I was just searching on songwriters, and I <laughs> ran across this this like twenty minute documentary that was about two young Nashville songwriters. Um, a guy named Steve Mokler and I can't remember it was a female singer or songwriter I can't remember her name and they were just talking about songwriting and the philosophy and you know how they write and what their process is and that kind of thing and and Steve Mokler played described acoustic guitar and played a song I'm like this guy's writing I really like his voice so I went and bought a CD and I listened to a CD to have like somebody that played on the CD that I was like oh so Andrew Rip and I'm gonna go check out Andrew Rip and now all of a sudden now I started discovering all these other mm-hmm. singer songwriter artists and stuff Completely by accident. Yeah. But that's what we used to do with the album. Right? Yeah. yeah. And the radio. You yeah. hear that thing. And yeah. so then now I'm like, well, there's stuff out there. Mm-hmm. There is. Just how are we going to find it? Yeah. That's the big question. When you talk about all this fucking glut. Yeah. You, know, you, you have to look because there's a lot of, there is a, a tremendous amount of BS. And when, when I look at the, when the who's on top of the charts now, I'm just like, really? Seriously? But look, do we still, because the rumor is, oh. like, in the business that I'm in as a writer and producer, the rumor is that the the script, no matter how, if it's a badass script, mm. you could be It'll, nobody in fucking Utah. Uh-huh. It will It'll work its way through. Top. Do you feel the well, same? What is the is difference, it, though, between how they, are the scripts written the same today as they were no, I mean, they change. Okay. They just styles, you know what I mean? But good, good they got to move faster, good, though, right? you know, pace. I mean, it's like all those You're things. You're a filmwriter. Right? Yeah, right. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. yeah and, whatever, whatever. I mean, we're coming to the, the conclusion, mm-hmm. I think, that, yeah, we got to do things to be noticed. Yeah, we have to do things to call attention because there's so much product out there. Mm-hmm. But good is still good. But we still believe. Mm-hmm. Like you, when somebody was saying earlier that your guy in the band said, we just got to keep playing and somebody will hear us and yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. get a record deal. And somebody else said, that doesn't work anymore. In my business, it still is that badass script. Yeah. If Something's you just gonna happen. put it on the internet somewhere, yeah. somebody's going to be like, man, did you read the script? I just came across the script. Did you see? And all of a sudden, yeah. it just starts doing And And every time it happens. If it's a badass script, somebody be like, hell, I just read the script. You gotta go see. You know what I mean. Cream it always happens. rises it to happens. the top. Yeah, and then you might have wrote it four years ago. Yeah, yeah. It gets to everybody. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. So I don't I know if it's the same with music at all because music changes so much. Music yeah. changes, and also the live medium too. And you just when you asked a few minutes ago, it's like, does anybody still go to concerts anymore? Mm-hmm. I will go see certain bands that I really like. Sure. Um, you know, it's not like it was back in the day when I would be out at three or four shows a week or whatever. Mm-hmm. You go see bands every weekend. It's like mm-hmm. people don't do that. People have. Like I was saying that, that, you know, our biggest competition now is Netflix mm-hmm. and babysitters. And, you know, and then we have, <laughs> I know with, with Cry Wolf, with the band, we broke up in 94. And then about five, six years ago, we ended up getting back together again and mm-hmm. played and put out a new CD. And, and we're, it was it was great. We're having a lot of fun with it. But there was there's a, a noticeable difference 
between trying to get people to shows now mm-hmm. and trying to get people to shows then. Mm-hmm. Because there's a certain curiosity factor. People mm-hmm. are like, oh, I'd love to see the band, see what you're doing. And they come see us play, and they're like, yeah, it was a great show. And it's like, well, we're playing in another three weeks on a Wednesday night. And they're yeah, like, well, ooh, yeah. Wednesday? Yeah. Did you know, oh, Wednesday? Wednesday? Wednesday, I'm sorry. Yeah. I have to watch the cat. I have to watch yeah. the cat. Yeah. We just saw you three weeks ago. I know. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's like, so trying to get people to continuously go out. Now, if you're if you're making a film, mm-hmm. you know that's you could watch the the same film, mm-hmm. you know that it's got a different set of legs now, and yeah. it, that will that could that could get legs and keep going and keep going. And they mm-hmm. could be like you could look at an album like that, I guess. Mm-hmm. Or if somebody's doing, I remember when when YouTube came out, we thought, oh, there aren't going to be any albums anymore; it's just going to be a series of videos, and mm-hmm. that's how people are going to be getting mm-hmm. their content by by or learning about new music is by watching videos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, who watches videos anymore now? <laughs> Nobody has time. I actually I mean, had a MTV doesn't even play videos. Anymore. I had a conversation yeah. with okay, I my I have an, I, a neighbor, a great a beautiful neighbor, but the but their beautiful daughter is twelve years old. Mm-hmm. Her name's Colette. We were talking about MTV, and she went, said to me, "What's MTV? Mm-hmm. Never mm-hmm. heard of MTV." At twelve, a twelve year old has never she heard of MTV. never heard of MTV. We were rushing home, and I said, yeah. and I said, right. remember when Thriller came out? Yeah. And you're like, I got to be oh, home by three thirty. And I said that to my wife, and I'm like, oh, Colette's never heard of MTV. She was like, she just shook her head. She's like, you know, I, and, and I said, well, it's a, it's a channel that would play <laughs> videos. Nothing just And she's like, videos. on TV? Like, <laughs> yeah. She's like, oh, well, you have YouTube. I didn't have YouTube back then. You'd have yeah. to wait. She's like, well, how do you know you'd want to watch the video? It's like, we just sit there and watch all the videos. We were a captive audience. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and watch the videos. Awesome. Yeah. Hoping that the next video that you want to see came up. She was like, hoping. Yes, that's, that's dumb. you know how many times I sat through fucking men without hats. Right? Oh, yeah, Jesus. But they did the same thing. These dreams yeah. go on when I close. I played that video. Was <laughs> 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 like I, I still know the words. Uh-huh. Brenda, where do you go when you want to hear a song? YouTube or Pandora. That's where you go. Yeah. And is it a song you're looking for, or is it a type of song? Um, if it's a type of song, then I go to Pandora. If it's a specific song, then I'll do YouTube. Yeah. So, um, I don't mean to have the last word, but I, I promise Phil I've only taken an hour of his life. <laughs> it's it's an three. hour and 48. <laughs> and oh, man, I and we started that. late. And I still got to get my ass whooping <laughs> from uh, Hill because <laughs> white music. And he was like, oh, no. And I said, oh, okay, I'll take this in public and we'll record it. So <laughs> you I would Scott, love if you guys you call, to stick what? around. That's- I would That's love what if Bob you guys, Marley was doing. Look, you know what? I would love if you guys would stick around because you could, you know, I'll take my ass with him from Hill and I'll take my ass with him from the rest of you. But I was making a point and I'll stand behind that. Um, we got But it is an hour and forty nine. And damn it, Phil! Well, here you. Yesterday, Phil probably, was like, "Dude, I don't know uh, what we're gonna talk about." I'm like, I don't know. And, and in all honesty, when everybody drive down, we're like, "What are you gonna talk to him about?" So we listen to some music and we're like, well, you know, "And we know, we know, we're gonna figure it out." Yeah. But we didn't know until we got it. But it was great. Oh, yeah. You're just really having was. the conversation. That's what yeah. makes it interesting. Right? Yeah. I'm pretty good at talking and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, you have a perspective that is, first of all, unique for, for us. Never mind us. It's mm-hmm. unique for me because I, growing up and growing up as a musician, I got to see that you in Truant and the ride you took in Cry Wolf was just influential to all of us who yeah. were of just a little younger than you. Wow. So... That was great, and we could talk about that all day. But, you know, we also are here in this show to solve the world's problems. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody's input on solving the world's problems, especially yours, Phil Decker. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I want to say so one thing, too, as we wrap this up. So, yeah, we've heard a lot of people, and, you know, it is about choices and sacrifices. And, you know, some people are grinding, and, and they, they don't need a kid, or they don't need medical coverage, you know. But other people have to do different choices. We had a, a guy named Jason McEnroth on the show who – Rocked as hard as anybody could ever rock, oh, a drummer, man. and uh, toured with Henry Rollins and just beat the fuck out of the drums, oh, yeah. you know, and it was, was top notch. But when Blue Man Group said, how, you, how about you just live in Vegas and play seven gigs a week and make money, mm-hmm. raise your sons, raise your sons, yeah. and he's like, I'm the hardest rocker there is and I'll take that gig right now. Twice. Some people want yeah. stability. Derek's been basically. Mm-hmm. Derek yeah. lives a great life, yeah. you know? So there, like, there are like ways to do it. or something, or you know, certain call, call, or something like that. Call, yeah. And it's excellent. He's, he's fantastic. Kid. And he lives a great, solid, stable life, you know? Yeah. And there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, I mean, it's good, good work if you can get it. Absolutely. And you can get it if you can get it. <laughs> <laughs>
are we going to finish with a song? <laughs> <laughs> I think we just did. <laughs>